Elaine Park was a creative and uninhibited spiritual woman in La Crescenta, California. Her deeply ingrained passion for acting and an imagination suited for personal expression were cut short by an unexplainable unself disappearance in January of 2017, leaving all who knew her across her Los Angeles neighborhood and the entirety of Southern California at large, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. In the hope of providing more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of Elaine Park's disappearance and the deeply disturbing pattern of mysterious happenings all around the shores of Malibu. Elaine Park was born on September 24, 1996 to parents Ray and Susan Park in Los Angeles, California. She was an only child for a short while until her younger brother, Dustin, was born a few years later. At an early age, Elaine showed a propensity for social activities and exploring her imagination. She loved to perform for her family and made friends with just about anyone. She was a social butterfly at school and always seemed to be in the mood to create. As Elaine neared her preteen years, however, he was met with an all-too-common occurrence for children around the world. Her parents informed her that they would be filing for divorce and her father, Ray, would be moving out. The news hits Elaine hard. Being the age she was, the fracturing of her family brought a melancholy mood upon her. She would later say the situation resulted in bouts of depression, however it didn't completely debilitate her, and as she reached high school, Elaine found various outlets to help express her emotion. One of her favorite activities was dance and cheer. She was on the cheerleading squad at her local high school, Crescenta Valley High in La Crescenta, California, the neighborhood she lived in with her mother and brother. With the cheer squad, Elaine eventually made cheer squad champion while helping her fellow cheerleaders and upcoming underclassmen fit within the team. Besides cheer, Elaine also enrolled at CVHS's theater program, falling in love with all things plays and musicals. When she wasn't cheering at football games or performing on stage, Elaine was dancing in her free time, a huge fan of hip-hop, rap, and R&B. In fact, her passion for music grew so much she got into singing as well, sometimes writing lyrics for songs she thought up, even going as far to record a few raps upon reaching adulthood. After graduating high school, Elaine couldn't quite set her mind on what she wanted to do for a career. Her interests bounced around so many artistic endeavors beyond just music and dance. She grew especially fond of acting and submitted headshots and acting reels to casting agencies, always keeping an eye open for background acting gigs and bit parts in Hollywood, only a 30-minute drive from her home. These dreams of acting materialized with roles in movies such as role models and crazy stupid love. Regardless of the position, Elaine was putting her heart into everything she did. When she wasn't acting, she was busy sketching tattoo designs or practicing new makeup techniques or coming up with new and unique fashion ideas. Fashion slowly became one of Elaine's truest loves. She had an uncanny ability to come up with trendy brainstorms with marketing strategies and future spin-offs that only someone truly dedicated to their work could come up with. Elaine spoke of these ideas and her design to make an impact on the fashion world with her on and off again boyfriend, Divine Compare, whom she met in 2016. She had recently moved back in with her mother in Lacro Center after being laid off from a waitressing job. When she spoke of her fashion designer dreams with Divine, known as D.I.V. Divine was the son of film and music producer Shackham Compare and met Elaine through mutual music industry interests. Elaine would sometimes stay with Divine and over text one night, shared her passionate ideas about clothing and branding. While Elaine opened her heart like she so often did through her extroverted and spirited personality, her relationship with Divine didn't last forever. The two never really formed a bond as partners and eventually broke off contact in January of 2017 when Elaine informed D.I.V. that she needed time for herself to truly focus on her future and next steps. The hiatus in their relationship only lasted a few weeks, however, until January 27, 2017 when the two made plans to see a movie and spend the night together. It was apparently nothing more than two lovers reigniting their fling. That is until the next morning. On January 28, 2017, when Elaine left Divine Compare's guest house in Calabasas, California, never to be seen again. Elaine Park's story and the circumstances around her disappearance require a deeper look into her past, dating back to about a year and a half before she went missing. This exercise involves the topic of sexual assault and viewer discretion is advised. We'll now review the timeline of events leading to Elaine's disappearance. 
On July 27, 2015, Elaine Park attends a concert with a few friends at the Orange County Observatory in Santa Ana, California, featuring artists such as Father and Playboy Cardi. Later that night, Elaine is invited backstage by one of the artist's touring managers. She ventures back there with her friends, but her friends don't stay long after feeling uncomfortable. Elaine wants to stay and whilst backstage consumes both Xanax and alcohol. At some point during her time backstage, Elaine is sexually assaulted by multiple men while inebriated by the drugs and alcohol. In the following days and weeks, Elaine struggles to remember the night of July 27th but fears she may have been raped. Nonetheless, she remains mostly quiet about the subject, despite the situation deeply affecting her. Flash forward almost a year later to July of 2016, and Elaine endures a car accident that leaves her with scratches on her hand when she helps to get the people in the second vehicle free. Her friend Sadie, who was driving, also walks away mostly unharmed. Over the remainder of summer 2016, Elaine and her mother, Susan, engage in a few fights regarding an insurance claim settlement from her very minor injuries. Elaine begins seeing a chiropractor against her own desires and the mother and daughter's relationship fractures. In November of 2016, Elaine meets Devine Compare, the son of entertainment producer Shackham Compare. On Tuesday the 8th, Elaine and Devine get together and begin what would transform into an on-again, off-again relationship. Throughout the rest of the month, Elaine and D.I.V. hang out frequently, often smoking weed with their friends and discussing their daily lives over text. They talk about going to a concert together and Divine's car breaking down in a text conversation now available to the public. Elaine's fortune changes for the worst when the calendar flips to December 2016. She moves back in with her mother in Lacro Center after living with her friend Daisy. Elaine is also fired from her waitressing job while dropping out of classes at Pierce College simultaneously. On December 1st, Elaine opens up to Divine over text about a fashion design and marketing plan she was brewing. It is one of the many moments Elaine displays her creative soul and the promise she had in her artistic endeavors. Within the next couple of weeks, Elaine encounters further arguments with her mother about money and petty cash. At the same time, Elaine's birth father, Ray, completes his final child support payment to Susan. Sometime in mid to late December, Elaine appears to go through a personal crisis as she unfollows and or blocks her childhood friends from all her social media accounts. Elaine's crisis continues through the latter third of December when reminders and memories of her sexual assault in 2015 begin to resurface. She reaches out to the Turing manager she knew, a man by the name of Michael, who tells Elaine that while he doesn't have concrete memories of an assault happening, he says it wouldn't surprise him. When Michael asks Elaine why she's calling him a year and a half later, Elaine says she can no longer block the feeling from her mind and that her art and design is no longer helping her cope and she needs answers. Around the same time, on December 28, 2016, Elaine posts a Twitter thread about her experience dealing with the trauma of sexual assault. She also says that the people involved, quote, know damn well who they are, but that she wouldn't fight them or make it a legal matter. Over the next couple of days and into the new year, the text conversation between Elaine and Devine wanes and becomes less responsive. Then on January 3rd, Elaine breaks up with Devine over text. One of the lines of text reads, quote, I need this year to really invest in myself right now. So I'm gonna grind and spend time alone until I can get myself real right. Devine responds by saying it isn't what he wants and that he will fight for Elaine because she is all he has. On the night of January 20th, Devine sends a string of texts to Elaine, saying he is in Utah but wants a response from her. He tells her she can't hold in whatever she's holding in while he also needs to let out something to her before reassuring her that he'll be by her side supporting her no matter what. A week later, in the pre-dawn hours of January 26th at 3.45 a.m., Elaine calls her mother Susan to report her car out of gas and the battery dead. According to Susan, she and her boyfriend, Jeff, drove to Elaine's location to deliver gas and jumpstart her car. The following day, on the morning of Friday, January 27th, Susan sends Elaine $20 and asks for a payment by 6 p.m. Later in the day, around 5 p.m., Elaine visits her father, Ray, to pick up cash for the weekend. Ray would later say his daughter acted perfectly normal during this visit. An hour later, at 6.01 p.m., Elaine receives a text from Susan regarding the money she lent her. Another hour passes by and at 7 p.m., Elaine's friend Sadie stops by Elaine's house to pick up her hair-curling wand. 
Elaine hands it to Sadie without saying a word and as Sadie climbs back into her car, she turns around to see Elaine locking the front door as she leaves herself. In the next 30 minutes, Elaine reaches her car and departs Lacro Center to meet up with Divine Comparatives Place in Calabasas, California. At around 8, 10 p.m., Elaine arrives in Calabasas. 54 minutes later, at 9, 4 p.m., Elaine responds to Susan's texts, saying she'll have the money back to her later that night. Susan sends a text back only a minute later at 9.05 p.m. asking Elaine to keep her word. A little less than an hour and a half later at 10.20 p.m. Elaine and Devine take an Uber from Calabasas to the AMC movie theater in the nearby neighborhood of Woodland Hills. Moments after Elaine made a stop at her car and is captured on the CCTV footage at the Compare residence. Another vehicle is also spotted on camera but departs the driveway just as the Uber pulls up. Over two hours later, at 12.43 a.m. on Saturday, January 28, 2017, Devine and Elaine return from the movies in Calabasas as captured by the Compare family's CCTV. At 3.20 a.m., Elaine checks her social media profiles on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat for the final time. Not long after, at around 4 a.m., Devine wakes up to Elaine suffering a panic attack. He would later describe her as shaky and distressed, singing to herself but not speaking. Closer to sunrise, despite many pleas from Divine, who believes Elaine is not in a proper state of mind to drive, she dresses quickly and departs, not saying a word to Divine. At exactly 6.0453 a.m., Elaine is captured by CCTV cameras walking out of Devine's guest house through the parking area and to her car. A couple of minutes pass by and at 6.07 a.m., Elaine pulls away from the Compare family's driveway and through the gates of the community where a camera picks up Elaine's license plate. This is the last confirmed sighting of Elaine Park. At 6.28 a.m., Elaine's location is shared with Devine via their Apple iMessage app, while her Facebook Find My Friend activity is initiated simultaneously. It's unknown whether or not this is manually set by Elaine or just an automatic update. Devine does not respond to the iMessage notice. 45 minutes later, at 7.13 a.m., new cookies appear on Elaine's iPhone for the Pandora Music app. Over an hour passes and by 8.51 a.m., three times demanding the money she owes her. Soon after, at 9.28 a.m., Elaine's Pandora app sends an automated message asking if she's still listening to music. Between 10.13 and 10.15 a.m., Divine attempts to call Elaine three times, but none of the calls connect through. At 10.50 a.m., Susan Park calls her boyfriend Jeff, followed by a since-deleted text at 12.04. An hour later, at 1.10 p.m., Elaine's friend Sadie texts her, asking what she's doing today, but receives no response. Between 1.33 and 1.34 p.m., Divine tries calling Elaine two more times, still unsuccessfully. At around the same time, between 1.36 and 1.42 p.m., Susan attempts to reach her daughter three times by phone, but she can't get through. Two hours later, at 3.42 p.m., the last ping to originate from Elaine's phone hits a cell tower in Malibu, California. Later that night, two ticks before midnight, Susan calls the Crescenta Valley Sheriff's Office to report Elaine missing. They ask if Elaine has ever run away from home before, and Susan says yes. Susan later claims the Sheriff's Office recommended she wait one more day as Elaine would most likely be voluntarily missing. The following day, on Sunday, January 29th, Susan expresses a desire to her boyfriend, Jeff, to officially file the missing persons believing that Elaine would have paid her back by now had she been okay. At 9.40 a.m. on Monday, January 30th, Susan reaches out to Elaine's friend Sadie, saying she is worried and that Elaine's makeup is gone, along with a blue traveling bag she may have taken to Davina's. Finally, Susan calls the same sheriff's station as well as Glendale Police Department at 11.48 a.m. to report Elaine missing. An officer arrives at Susan's La Crosse Center residence that afternoon at 4.25 p.m., where he calls Elaine's father to ask if he knew anything. This is the first time Ray hears of his daughter's disappearance and says he hasn't seen or heard from Elaine since her visit on Friday the 27th. Two days later, on February 2nd, Susan and Jeff visit Devine's parents. They have no idea where Elaine is and Susan departs only to visit the Lost Hills Sheriff Department to request a ping on Elaine's phone. The station is able to locate a ping from Coral Canyon Road Cell Tower in Malibu. 
Later that day, Elaine's car is discovered on the 26,000 block of Coral Canyon Road on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California, a 30-minute drive from where she was last seen. The vehicle's doors are unlocked and the key is in the ignition with the electric turned on, not the engine. Inside the car are her belongings. Her black backpack with a laptop inside in the passenger seat, her cell phone, the blue travel bag with toiletries, and about $30. All in plain sight. The car is taken in for analysis and no signs of foul play or break-ins are discovered. The car is in fine condition outside of the battery being dead. A month passes by and no leads are uncovered. On March 2nd, Elaine's Facebook is logged into for the first time and all of her history is deleted. Ten days later, on March 10th, a massive search goes underway in Calabasas to find Elaine, but the search efforts turn up empty. Eleven days later, on March 21st, and the settlement in Elaine's car accident lawsuit is finalized, with her name being signed on the document and $5,000 awarded to the estates of Elaine Park. Forty-five days later, on May 6, 2017, a cadaver dog search is initiated at the park residence. They uncover no major clues. Fast forward over five years since Elaine's disappearance and law enforcement is no closer to finding Elaine Park than they were back in 2017, especially after the Compare family and the Park family have been deemed non-suspects by police. Despite a large reward some being posted, lots of community activism and the work of various investigators and journalists, Elaine's trail has grown cold. The first segment of the CCTV clip shows Elaine walking out of her ex-boyfriend's house, leaving the parking area and supposedly making a stop at her car. However, there is another car with its lights turned on and it turns around through the driveway before leaving the residence, driving away and up the hill in the background. Elaine then returns to the car park area where she approaches the compare home entry. Before she enters, however, Divine Compare exits himself and follows Elaine back to the driveway. Simultaneously, the Uber they order to take them to the cinema drives down the hill toward the house and pulls into the drive. Some viewers claim they can see Elaine and Devine enter two different cars. However, law enforcement have stated they took the same Uber both there and back from the movie theater. The second segment of CCTV footage depicts Elaine and Devine returning from the cinema about three hours later. The Uber drops them off and departs as it should, and the couple enters the compare compound at a normal pace. The third segment of the recording is the most mystifying. At around 6 a.m., Elaine is captured leaving the Compare residence by herself, this time walking at a much more hurried pace. She hops into her car somewhere in the driveway and pulls away from the Calabasas home. Viewers again point to something strange they notice at this point in the video. They call out the shadow. That flicker across the wall on the left side of the frame when Elaine is about to disappear from view, theorizing it may be a third party watching Elaine from afar running in the background when they see she is about to leave. However, if you go back to the first segment, you'll notice those same shadows appear on that same wall each time Elaine walks back towards the driveway in both directions. It is simply Elaine's shadow from a light off screen and is not a hidden clue. What is a helpful clue? is the license plate reader footage that is included at the end of the video. This captures Elaine's vehicle as it leaves the Compare family's gated community and gives you a clear look at her license plate number, 7NKR261. If you have any information regarding this license plate number from the early morning hours of January 28, 2017, or anything else that appears in the video, you can call 1-800-222-8477. Or go to lawcrimestoppers.org. As previously stated, the following section involves the topic and discussions of sexual assault and viewer discretion is advised. The first theory many people jump to when they hear Elaine's story is that her boyfriend, Divine Kampa, had something to do with her disappearance. Besides the obvious fact that he was the last person to see Elaine alive, people point to his connections with musicians and rappers around Los Angeles and how he might be connected to the sexual assault Elaine survived. In 2015, while Devine wasn't at the concert in question in July of 2015, he did have connections with some of the performers and people backstage who may or may not have been there when Elaine was assaulted. People wonder if this is what Devine is referring to in the text messages made available to the public after she breaks up with him when he says, quote, I need to let all this out to you. Followed later by, quote, you can't hold all that in, let it out, what's going on? People wonder if this is Devine coaxing Elaine to say everything she knows about her assault in 2015 to make sure she isn't about to take the information to the police and expose either Devine's contacts or Devine himself. 
They back this up with information gathered in 2018 by people part of the investigation who noted that a witness had observed Elaine and Devine getting into a verbal altercation the evening of Thursday, January 27th. And it was over the assault allegations and Devine's role in them. The testimony then stated the following day, the couple didn't actually go to the movies the evening of January 27th and instead the arguments boiled over before Elaine went missing the next morning potentially at the hands of Devine or a theoretical accomplice. To accentuate this theory, many point to the CCTV footage and take issue with how it conveniently ends right after Elaine leaves the property and what follows isn't publicly available. It casts a suspicious light over the compare family at large and definitely leaves room to wonder. However, there are many pieces to the case that address and refute this theory. First and foremost is that Devine himself has been heavily investigated by law enforcement and private detectives and cleared of all suspicion. That's not all though. Let's look at the materials we have ourselves. We have the texts Devine was sending to Elaine after their breakup. And nowhere did it ever show Devine was making threatening comments or showing a lack of support to Elaine. In fact, he was quite supportive of Elaine overall, saying that he would be there for her and that they'd make it to the other side. In interviews with other amateur investigators, Devine stated he never pressed Elaine about her assault experience and that she was truly attempting to figure it out on her own, but was struggling with the weight of holding it all in and not being able to remember it for over a year. There's also the matter of Elaine's tweets from the night of December 28th, where she talks about her emotions and trauma as a result of the assaults, but also the wisdom she wants to give to others. Most notably, at the beginning of the thread, she says that while the people who assaulted her know who they are, she is not out to frame anyone, pursue legal action, or enact justice through accusatory means. Rather, she wants to heal from her trauma on her own terms and leave the law out of it. In addition, one evening before Elaine went missing, she posted a live Periscope stream of a rap she had written, the lyrics very strongly hinting at her relationship and breakup with Divine. Through her rap, Elaine never talked about Divine as if he was connected to her assault or really about the assault at all. Rather, she explained the reason she and Divine couldn't be together was a difference in morals and materialistic desires. Thus, Elaine, both publicly and privately, was adamant about not pursuing some sort of legal or vigilante justice. If someone wanted her dead because of that, there's absolutely zero proof Elaine would have tried it anyway, most likely ruling out one of her assaulters or Divine. The only other sensible motive that would pit Devine against Elaine is being upset that they broke up and not wanting it to end like it did. However, as exemplified by the text messages and interviews Devine has taken part in, he has shown no animosity towards Elaine or anger about their relationship. Also, it must be taken into consideration the date Elaine and Devine went on the night before she went missing. A couple facing that much volatility and tension simply doesn't go to the movies together and pretend like everything is normal for a couple of hours. The Uber drivers who drove the pair have since been tracked down and interviewed and have stated they didn't suspect anything was wrong with either Divine or Elaine, that they were hugging and kissing during the car rides, and overall sporting a calm demeanor. There was an instance in which the Uber driver said Devine asked Elaine if she was good a couple of times, but Elaine always replied yes and never displayed any sort of warning signs. While the CCTV footage is distressing and adds suspicion to the Compare family, there simply isn't a shred of physical proof or sensible motive that connects them to foul play in the case. So if there are holes in the theory that Devine had something to do with it, what about other love interests or ex-boyfriends in Elaine's life? There was one man from Elaine's past that caught the attention of law enforcement, an underground rapper by the stage name of Lolo. Lolo and Elaine had a short fling sometime in the year leading up to Elaine's disappearance. However, the quick relationship wasn't sunshine and roses. Lolo was quite clingy and creeped out Elaine's closest friends. He would repeatedly call her even after Elaine tried to sever ties. And despite being blocked on multiple numbers, Lolo would find new phones to contact her with. In addition, there were times Lolo would angrily text Elaine, saying things like he wanted to fight her for not responding, and that, quote, people were gonna die. Most glaring of all was an incident in 2016, in which Elaine and Lolo were pulled over and the car was searched by police. Authorities found an unauthorized firearm in Lolo's backpack, a firearm Elaine had no knowledge of. Elaine was set to testify at Lolo's court hearing on the matter mere weeks after she went missing, and some wonder if Lolo was involved to prevent her testimony from entering evidence. 
Not only that, but Lola was released from jail pre-trial just two days before Elaine disappeared in Venice Beach, just a quick drive south on the Pacific Coast Highway from where Elaine's car was discovered in Malibu. Could he have left imprisonment and done something to Elaine to protect himself from his firearm charge? There are two things that suggest this isn't the case. First, Elaine's testimony wouldn't alter the outcome of Lolo's charges. Elaine didn't know he had the gun and therefore couldn't give any sort of insight into when or how he obtained it. So had she just told the truth, which is what her friends told her to do, she would have explained her perspective and been dismissed without altering the ruling. Second, Lola was eventually tracked down by both law enforcement and private investigators. The PIs were the ones to first alert Lolo of Elaine's disappearance, and his reaction was one of genuine concern. He stated that he had stopped attempting to contact Elaine after his arrest and her continued pleas for space, but still thought about her every day. While it definitely appears he had an unhealthy obsession with Elaine, Lolo fully cooperated with the PIs and later the authorities, consistently making offers to help look for Elaine and provide as much assistance as he could. Without a true motive and taking into consideration his behavior after the disappearance, the theory of his involvement is highly unlikely. Recently, one theory has caught fire amongst many across the internet. One suggesting that Susan Park is herself responsible for her daughter's disappearance. Like all missing person cases, the parents are usually the first to have fingers pointed at them, both by police and passerby. And it makes sense to some degree. They are usually the closest to the victim and some of the last people to make contact with them. In the case of Susan, her portrayal in certain media regarding Elaine's disappearance has caught many by surprise and led to a larger network of people who want to jump on the coincidences and misrepresentations of her actions. Susan's suspicion lingers on a few aspects of her relationship with her daughter, most notably their propensity for arguing and both verbal and sometimes physical conflict. Susan and Elaine would fight about money even in amounts as low as $5, ending up in cursing matches loud enough to wake the neighbors and sending texts with intense and anger-ridden tones. The pair were not close and spent more time bickering than getting along. But in the end, that's how the entire family was. Elaine often spoke to her friends about how discordant her family life was. Since Ray and Susan got divorced in 2008, and even while they were all still under the same roof, the family didn't spend much time bonding. And the blame for who caused the divorce was thrown around even onto Elaine. There was very little love and nurturing once Elaine and her brother entered their preteen and teenage years. And the connection that a lot of families have with one another simply didn't exist. Susan will admit much the same. A lot of people point to Susan's openness about being a bad mother and failing her daughter. Susan knows she and Elaine didn't have a great relationship, but that doesn't automatically mean she would go to great lengths to kill her. Susan also has spoken about the cultural differences between an Asian American family and the prototypical American family, and how it is not considered or even understood by people who have been conditioned to think families cannot toe the lines of verbal abuse without there being murderous tendencies. The texts Susan sent to Elaine, saying, quote, die, and calling her brutal names are despicable and disturbing, particularly considering what would happen just months later. But the tragic truth is that these types of sentiments are shared by families all over the world. And just because it's beyond any sort of family dynamic we are used to, it doesn't make Susan a killer, an abusive bully, and terrible guardian, perhaps, but it does not prove her a murderer. The theory also hinges on Susan's actions after Elaine went missing, like her alibi being changed at certain points, or how quickly she got rid of Elaine's belongings and rented out her room and cleaned her clothes that may have had valuable evidence on them. But the fact of the matter is that the police told Susan repeatedly they had no leads and nothing really to investigate. While there was belief that Elaine may have gone involuntarily missing, they had no reason to collect Elaine's things and would have collected them before Susan got rid of it all had there been any reason to do so. In the end, everyone's process of grieving and responding to trauma is different. Yes, you usually see the parents of missing children keep their bedrooms and belongings in their original condition for decades, but just because a mother in another case doesn't do it doesn't insinuate guilt of any kind. Ultimately, Susan did keep a few things of Elaine's, just in case she returned. Finally, we must shed light on the amount of effort Susan has put into finding Elaine. Nobody who makes someone else disappear goes to the length Susan has gone to try and put a spotlight on the victim's case. Both the Park parents have been fully cooperative with both outside investigators and law enforcement. Susan has made countless media appearances and despite some of them pitting her own past against her, continuously pleads for help to find Elaine. 
The risk of exposure would be far too high had she committed a crime. We may not like the way she treated Elaine and the things she said to her daughter, but we cannot conflate coincidence or bias with fact. So if someone close to her didn't make Elaine disappear, could it have been a stranger? It is certainly possible. Three routes to this theory exist. The first path is one taken by someone Elaine made contact with in the year before her disappearance but not related to the assault in 2015. The most likely suspect would be someone connected to the drugs that Elaine would sometimes involve herself in. It's a known fact via the text messages between her and Devine that Elaine frequently smoked weed and purchased weed and other weed-related paraphernalia around Los Angeles. While weed was legalized in California the same month, Elaine and Devine started hanging out. In November of 2016, studies have shown that 80 to 90 percent of cannabis purchasing went through underground channels despite this. Cannabis wasn't the only drug Elaine had connections to either. While she wasn't a dealer herself, nor did she frequently consume such drugs, it was known that Elaine had contacts for dealers with substances such as Xanax and codeine. While drug dealing isn't always hand-in-hand -hand with other violence or criminal activity, it definitely opens up the pool of suspicious people Elaine may have interacted with. The second path to the outsider theory is simply someone Elaine ran into the morning she left Devine's house. We know that Elaine loves to drive, her Devine's own words. He spoke about how that was her way to decompress and wind down and maybe that's why she left so quickly on the 28th to get out of the panic spiral and go for a drive. We also know that a little while after her car was spotted leaving the gated community in Calabasas, her location was shared with Divine and she started listening to music on Pandora, both natural occurrences, had she planned to be driving for a bit. This is where the theory truly becomes a theory. It would make sense that maybe along the way, Elaine wanted to drive along the Pacific Coast Highway overlooking the ocean and grew tired. After a sleepless night, only to park her car by Coral Canyon for a nap. This is where it was found four days later. So if she did stop to rest, maybe someone stopped by and pretended they needed help or simply kidnapped her when no one was looking. This theory struggles to hold weight when you look deeper at the facts. It's agreed upon by many that Elaine's vehicle was probably planted at the location it was found by her kidnappers rather than it being the origin of Elaine's disappearance. Due to how neat everything was found in the vehicle and how there was no trace of Elaine found in the vicinity. The spot where Elaine's car was found is also a very busy section of Malibu and has frequent tourists stopping by, even at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. If something were to have happened to Elaine against her will, someone would have heard something or seen something. People also claim there's no way the car would have been able to sit in the location it was at for four days without being ticketed or towed, or at least observed by police. However, that section of the Pacific Coast Highway is known for parked cars sitting along the coast for days, if not weeks at a time. And it is totally reasonable that the L.A. County Sheriff missed it, if not completely ignored it. The third and final path to an outsider theory is that a serial killer is operating in or around Malibu, California, and law enforcement in the area has failed to make arrests, allowing people like Elaine to become a victim. In this general area of Malibu, there has been a string of disappearances and murders in the last decade plus, most famously featuring the disappearance and death of Matt Rice Richardson and the murders at Malibu Creek State Park. The latter crimes were covered up by the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station, which had a long history of scandals and similar legal issues, including releasing Matt Rice in the middle of the night, instead of holding her until her family was able to pick her up the next day. As reported on by C.C. Woods of the local Malibu, she has also shed light on this case while helping to advocate for Elaine Park and believes there may be more to the disappearances. It is possible Elaine pulled over on the PCH, left her stuff in her car, hiked the hills in Malibu until she went too far and ended up in the wrong hands. It is a little far-fetched, but still a potential explanation. The final theory put forth in Elaine's case is suicide. Some of the precursors are there. Elaine was suffering from a mental health break due to the trauma of her assault and displaying signs of reclusiveness from her friends, whom she had been slowly blocking on social media. She was also feeling alienated from home and the constant bickering with her mother regarding the money she owed could have been a breaking point. Combined with the bizarre and hurried morning she had with Devine before she went missing, it is possible Elaine got in her car, drove to the beach, and decided she would try an alternative way to escape the turmoil and trauma. Some say this is highly unlikely that she wouldn't have left her phone in her car and at least would have taken it with her, but that doesn't mean anything. 
It's too often we assume that just because the younger generation grew up with phones in their pockets that they are all addicted and cannot go a few minutes without being online. It simply isn't true. A lot of people who are overwhelmed and dealing with anxiety, depression, and panic disorder want nothing to do with what's on their phone and want to be isolated and alone. If Elaine was struggling with social pressures and the constant texts and calls from her mother, it totally makes sense that Elaine would want to leave her phone behind if she was going to de-stress for a while, if not depart for good. Elaine could also have had a bad reaction to drugs she may have taken during the last night she spent with Devine. Devine has said the pair didn't consume drugs or alcohol on the night of the 27th. But those statements were taken in front of his parents and the use of such substances cannot be 100% ruled out. Maybe he tried to persuade Elaine from leaving that morning or driving because she was under the influence of something or she simply smoked too much weed and grew paranoid. This may have led to a lot of guilt and while Devine should absolutely never hide information like this, Elaine could have been in an altered state and taking her phone with her wherever she went was simply an afterthought. Again, it's hard to believe Elaine could have disappeared in the area that she did and committed suicide without a body ever appearing. But stranger things have happened in the hills of Malibu. And with the law enforcement's shady history, it's not impossible they missed a major clue. It should also be noted that the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station does not have jurisdiction in Elaine's case. That belongs to Glendale Police Department due to Elaine's address falling in their precinct's jurisdiction. But the drastic difference in locales for each law enforcement agency makes it hard to coordinate searches and know exactly where to look, which still unacceptably falls in the hands of police. The communication needed to be clearer for search efforts to go underway as they should have. And it leaves so many theories to Elaine's disappearance, unfortunately open-ended. The case of Elaine Park is as tragic as they come. The fate of a young woman with such a big heart and such massive potential is unknown, vanishing without a shred of physical evidence left behind. It truly is as maddening as cold case investigations come and makes drawing a conclusion nearly impossible. In our estimation, we believe the most likely scenario is a combination of the theories previously mentioned. Elaine most likely suffered some sort of mental collapse with the trauma of her assault weighing down on her and the panic attacks restraining her physically and emotionally. It is what made her leave in such a mad rush on the morning of January 28, 2017. And the lack of support from either friends or family only added to her feelings of being confused and unwanted. While we believe Elaine was under psychological distress, we don't believe she committed suicide, mostly because of the situation with her car. We believe she went somewhere to cope with her newfound state of panic, potentially under the influence of drugs, and ran into someone who ultimately took advantage of a woman desperate for help, much like someone took advantage of her in July of 2015. Whoever this was then brought Elaine's car somewhere away from the crime to a place where parked cars are constantly abandoned along the coast of the Pacific Ocean in Malibu, California. Here, they left behind Elaine's belongings to stage a runaway. While there's an argument to be had about Elaine running away and leaving her phone behind, no one runs away and leaves plain cash behind. That's the one thing you would need if you were planning to stage a disappearance. No, Elaine's life was purposely positioned to warrant the least amount of suspicion on foul play. And in the end, that's exactly where we ended up anyway. Who this perpetrator is is anyone's best guess. But it is most likely not Divine, Lolo, or Elaine's family. While we can't rule it out 100%, it would take a huge piece of physical evidence to make that scenario a dominant lead. As gut-wrenching as it is to walk away from such an in-depth investigation without a conclusive hypothesis, it should not take away from the efforts we continue to make in our search for Elaine. While it's unlikely, there is still a chance Elaine is out there alive and breathing. It is up to us to bring her home and if not, at least bring about closure and justice for Ray, Susan, and Dustin Park. Until then, it's important to shine a light on Elaine's legacy. Elaine, despite growing up in a broken home without a lot of love to receive, was the first to bring that love to others. She nurtured relationships with many friends and put her heart into everything she did. She was well on her way to being an iconic fashion designer. An effervescent actress and dancer and lyricist, a powerful poet, and above all, a passionate and personable artist. She was a survivor whose entire being was filled with courage and strength. She spoke her heart so that others without a voice may find solace in her persistence. She had dreams like the rest of us and so much more to share. We must find a way to make those dreams a reality and allow her imagination to return to the world. Even if Elaine Park remains missing, the positive impact she made on the world will not perish and the goodwill that she stood for will not be erased.
Ten-year-old Catherine Lyon and her sister, 12-year-old Sheila Lyon, lived in Kensington, Maryland in 1975. They lived with their parents, John and Mary, as well as their older brother, Jay. On March 25, 1975, Sheila and Catherine left their home between 11 a.m. and noon. Their mother instructed them to get back home by 4 p.m. They were heading to see the Easter exhibits in the Westfield Wheaton Plaza shopping mall, which was located about half a mile from their home. It was their spring break, so they planned on enjoying a day out, even having lunch at a pizzeria within the mall called the Orange Bowl. By 7 p.m., the Lions' sisters had still not returned home. Their parents then called police to report them missing. The extensive search and investigations for Sheila and Catherine revealed nothing about the location of the girls, but thanks to witness statements, it did help the police set up a timeline that they felt was accurate. At 1 p.m., a neighborhood boy saw the sisters outside the Orange Bowl. They were speaking to an unidentified man. At about 2 p.m., their elder brother Jay also noticed them at the pizzeria, alone and enjoying their meal. A friend of theirs then saw the girls walking westward down a street near the mall somewhere between 2.30 and 3 o'clock p.m. It was the direct route to their home. That was the last time Sheila and Catherine Lyon were seen alive. The neighborhood boy who recalled seeing Sheila and Catherine talking to someone outside the Orange Bowl described the unidentified man to be about 6 feet tall, 50 to 60 years old, and wearing a brown suit. He said that the man was carrying a briefcase with a tape recorder inside. The man was demonstrating a type of audio cassette player to the teens and children gathered near him, which included the Lion's sisters. Two composite sketches of him were created and released to the public, and several other witnesses came forward to declare that they had seen him in the mall that day. A girl around Sheila and Catherine's age then talked to the detectives and gave them a completely new possible suspect. She described how the young girls had confronted a man who had been staring so intently at them that it made them uncomfortable enough to act. He was described as a white male, 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighing roughly 140 pounds. It was believed he was in his late teens or early twenties. He had acne on his face and scars on his left cheekbone. The man wore a light-colored Peter's jacket as well as a blue and white horizontal striped shirt with white pants. The Lion's sister's disappearance shattered the sense of security in Kensington, Maryland, rattling parents to the point where they no longer let their children play outside or walk to Wheaton Plaza. Even with all the promising information, the case soon got plagued by false leads and questionable subjects, eventually making it go cold. An 18-year-old named Lloyd Lee Welsh went to a security guard at the Wheaton Mall a week after the girls disappeared. He said that he had been at the mall that day and saw the girls get abducted by the tape recorder man. Mall security then called the police, who took Lloyd to a nearby station. When the investigators made Lloyd take a lie detector test, Lloyd then confessed to having made the whole thing up. It was believed he was just interested in the $9,000 reward money being offered and he was released. On April 7, 1975, about two weeks after the disappearance, a witness in Manassas, Virginia reported seeing two girls resembling the Lions sisters in the rear of a beige 1968 Ford station wagon. The witnesses stated that the girls were bound and gagged in the vehicle. The driver of the vehicle resembled the man in the publicly available composite sketch. The witness further claimed that when the driver spotted the witness tailing him, he ran a red light and sped west on Route 234 towards Interstate 66. The station wagon had Maryland license plates with the possible combination of DMT-6. The last two numbers are unknown due to the bending of the car's plate. The known combination was issued in Cumberland, Hagerstown, and Baltimore at the time. This supposed sighting inspired a small army of mobile CB radio users to scour the area throughout the night with a running commentary and chatter, but without any tangible results. A search for matching plate numbers failed to produce any information. Although this witness's report was at first treated as credible and a media firestorm erupted because of it, it was later deemed questionable by police. The disappearance granted calls from psychics, extortionists, and detention seekers. Several phone calls from people claiming to be holding the girls for ransom were made to the Lyon family in the immediate aftermath of their disappearance. One began with an anonymous mail on April 4, 1975, and demanded that John Lyon leave a briefcase with $10,000 inside an Annapolis courthouse restroom. John Lyon left $101 in the briefcase, as directed by law enforcement officials. It was just enough to make the crime a felony, but the briefcase was never claimed. 
The same anonymous person called John later and said there were too many police officers around the courthouse and he could not retrieve the ransom. John said he would have to hear the girls' voices before he could do anything else. The caller never made contact again. There were suspects, but nothing that linked them to the crime, one being Fred Howard Coffey. Coffey was convicted in 1987 for assaulting and strangling a 10-year-old girl in North Carolina in 1979. Authorities learned that he interviewed for a job and was subsequently employed in Silver Spring, Maryland, six days after the Lions sisters vanished. This is a short distance from Wheaton Plaza. Investigators were unable to determine if Coffey was connected to the case and he was never charged in the disappearances. Raymond Rudolph Molesky Sr., a resident of Suitland, Maryland, at the time of the disappearance, took the lives of both his wife and teenage son in November 1977. He was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Based on both prison informants' tips and Molesky's own claims to know something about the case, which he offered to share more fully in exchange for more favorable prison conditions, authorities searched his former residence in April 1982. No evidence was discovered. Raymond Rudolph Molesky passed away in prison in 2004. Police interviewed countless witnesses and followed hundreds of tips. Every stand of woods or weeds were searched. Storm sewers were explored. As was every vacant house for miles, the residents of a nearby nursing home were interviewed one by one. Scuba divers groped through mud at the bottom of ponds. Nothing was found. Nothing came of anything the police did. The case haunted the Montgomery County Police Department. Generations of detectives had come and gone, and many had taken a crack at it. Periodically, a new team would start over, combing through the many boxes of yellowing evidence, hoping to find something missed. In 2012, the Montgomery County Police Department decided to make one final push to solve the Lions' sister's mystery. Their approach was to act as if a call had just come in for the two missing girls and to scour the boxes of case records as if starting from scratch. One of the most intriguing finds early on was a brief report written by investigators a week after the disappearances. The report was about 18-year-old Lloyd Lee Welsh that falsely claimed to see the tape recorder man abduct the sisters. The detectives newly plowing the case learned that Lloyd Welsh went on to compile an extensive criminal record. His record includes an arrest in 1977 in Montgomery County for breaking into a house eight blocks from Wheaton Plaza Mall and stealing $580. Worth of jewelry. The burglary case yielded a mugshot which bore a striking resemblance to a composite sketch drawn in 1975 of the man at the mall who stared at the lion girl so long that they confronted him. The newly assigned detectives learned Welsh was imprisoned in Delaware after being convicted of assaulting a 10-year-old girl in that state in 1998. Detectives drove to see him, not sure what to expect. Would he even want to talk to them? It turns out he did. Welsh talked and talked for eight hours. It was on October 16, 2013, that Detective Dave Davis traveled with Montgomery Deputy State's Attorney Pete Feeney to Dover, Delaware to interview Welsh. He acknowledged he was at the mall the day the Lions sisters were reported missing, but said he had no involvement in their disappearance. The investigators continued trying to uncover as much as they could about Welsh. They learned that his mother lost her life when the car driven by his drunken father, Lee, crashed. Lloyd Welsh was a passenger. He was placed in foster homes but ran away to live on the streets instead where he did whatever he wanted to. As an adult, he traveled around the country, sometimes hitchhiking, and at one point started a landscaping business in South Carolina. In that state, he was also convicted of assaulting a 10-year-old, just like in Delaware. As the detectives gathered Welsh's history, they repeatedly returned to interview him in Delaware. In subsequent interviews, Welsh lied elaborately and repeatedly about his connection to the Lion case. He eventually admitted that he had helped kidnap the girls, but insisted that the crime had been planned and carried out by others in his family. He would talk for hours, shifting his story and offering names of relatives he said he had seen abduct the lion girls and hold them captive. In the summer of 2014, investigators began an extensive probe of the entire Welsh clan. What the detectives found shocked them. The clan had two branches, one in Hyattsville, Maryland, and the other five hours southwest on a secluded hilltop in Thaxton, Virginia. It was a place locals called Taylor's Mountain. Here the family's Appalachian roots were still in existence, even though some members had gradually moved into more modern communities in and around Bedford, the nearest town. 
The family's mountain hollow weighs a suspicion of outsiders, an unruly contempt for authority, stubborn poverty, a knee-jerk resort to violence, set it perpetually at odds with mainstream suburbia. During one of the interviews, Welsh named relatives he had seen abuse and take the lives of at least one of the lion girls. If the sisters had been taken by this family, as Welsh claimed and the detectives now suspected, then someone in the family might help investigators with more information. In 2015, Welsh was claiming that the chief culprit had been his uncle Richard, who he said had planned the girl's kidnapping and demise. Richard Welsh was nearly 70 at the time but seemed older. In addition to heart trouble, he faced a frightening array of accusations. Various family members had accused him of ugly and violent behavior toward them in the past. Richard Welsh denied it all. He was summoned to appear before a grand jury in February 2015, where he still stuck to his story. He said he never saw either of the Lions sisters and did not know what happened to them. On May 12, 2015, detectives visited Lloyd Welsh again to see if he could tell them anything else. He continued spinning one story after the next to explain what had happened to Sheila and Catherine, always placing the blame for the crime on others. Gradually and often inadvertently, he revealed more and more about himself and the crime. The detectives came to realize that you had to forget the narrative. The way to read Welsh was to look past his stories to their details. Running through many of his versions were certain particulars that recurred, stalking girls in the mall, a station wagon, a crying girl, back seat, a basement access from the backyard, an axe, an army green duffel bag, and a bonfire. On a Monday in May 2015, Detective Dave Davis went looking for the place where Welsh said his uncle Richard had taken Catherine's life before stuffing her remains in a duffel bag and ordering him to take it to Taylor's Mountain. Uncle Richard's old house had been completely destroyed to make room court building, but Dave knew where it had been. Right away, Welsh's story didn't add up. The house was the last place he would bring two little girls who were the object of a massive manhunt. The house was right next to police headquarters. Dave next sought out Buchanan Street, which Lloyd Welsh had also mentioned and where members of the Welsh family had once lived. When Dave arrived there, he recognized the house from snapshots in the police file. It was the house where Lloyd Welsh's parents had lived. The current owners of the house led Dave to a basement only accessed by walking around the house to the rear. Dave stepped into a dark, low-ceiling stone dungeon heaped with old furniture. This was the place. He knew it. It was exactly where one would stash two frightened young girls. You could do anything without being seen or heard. Dave returned the next day with a forensics team. They squirted blue star spray to try and find any blood. It lit up from the floor to the ceiling. The room announced itself as the place where Sheila and Catherine Lyon, or at least one of them, spent their last moments. Welsh often talked about his Uncle Richard's sanctuary, but that was all untrue. This was the space where Lloyd Welsh hung out. It was his. Not long after, Dave Davis found the likely crime scene. The case against Lloyd Welsh was solid enough to charge him. On September 12, 2017, he pleaded guilty to ending the lives of both Sheila and Catherine Lyon. Despite pleading guilty, he still claimed that his involvement was in fact very limited. He was given a 48-year sentence, and given that he was 60 years old in 2017, it was essentially a life sentence. Lloyd Welsh still refuses to tell investigators where they can find the bodies. Investigators are still looking into the possibility that Lloyd Welsh did not act alone. Uncle Richard worked as a mall cop around the same time, and it would have been much easier for him to abduct the two girls than it would be for Lloyd Welsh. Let me know what you make of the case down in the comment section. Connie Margota was born in Rockville, Connecticut on July 31, 1976 to parents Cindy and Kenneth. Connie was one of four siblings, having two sisters, Marlies and Leslie, and a brother, Keith. The Margota children grew up in Vernon and Ellington. Connie attended Ellington High School, where she graduated in 1995, after which Connie attended the University of Connecticut. She attained her undergraduate degree in 1999 and began working as a pharmaceutical sales representative for Rekai Bankiizer. Everyone who knew Connie described her as a warm-hearted, generous person who would do anything for those she loved. Connie had many friends and was popular among everyone she met. In the early 2000s, Connie told her close friends about a man she had met. His name was Richard DeBate, and Connie was smitten. He was a handsome man who treated Connie like a queen. When Connie was introduced to Richard's family, they immediately knew that she was the one for him. Richard, or Rick as he was known, was born on July 29, 1976 to parents Richard Sr. and Julie DeBate. He grew up in Manchester, Connecticut, 
and graduated from Manchester High School in 1995. After finishing high school, Rick attended technical school before beginning his career in computer network administration. Ricky and Connie married on July 4, 2003 and had two sons, RJ and Connor. Connie was a devoted mother to her boys and Rick seemed like the perfect husband and family man. The debates lived in a beautiful home in Ellington on Birchview Drive. Two of Connie's closest friends, Peggy and Darlene, lived in the same neighborhood. Their families spent plenty of time together, with Peggy and Darlene often joking about what a doting husband Rick was to Connie. From any outside perspective, life of the debates looked picture perfect. They seemed to have it all. In reality, cracks had started to show. December 23, 2015 started like any other day. It was a Wednesday and everyone in Ellington felt a festive cheer with Christmas just two days away. At 8, 10 a.m., Rick dropped Connor and RJ off at the nearby bus stop. While he was out, Connie dressed and headed to a spin class at the local YMCA. What happened next is unclear. As Rick has given many differing versions of events, this is what he first told investigators after the incident. Rick dropped off the boys and then returned home to change into his work clothes. Once he was ready, Rick got back into his car at 8.30 a.m. and set off on the 40-minute drive to work. He wasn't on the road for long until he realized his laptop was still at home. Rick couldn't work without it. So he went onto his cell phone and emailed his supervisor that he would be late. As Rick looked at his phone, he happened to see a security alert about a silent alarm that had been triggered at his home. He mentioned this in the email as well. Rick headed back home and cautiously went inside. Rick heard a noise coming from upstairs and upon further investigation, it sounded like someone was in their main bedroom. The door was partially open. And when Rick looked inside, he was confronted by a masked intruder. It was a large framed man standing roughly six foot two inches tall wearing a dark green camouflaged outfit and mask. The intruder pulled out a knife and told Rick something along the lines of, give me your money, your wallet, and your pins, and if you don't, I'm gonna wait here for your wife and kids. The man had a deep voice which Rick compared to sounding like Vin Diesel. Rick had been with the intruder for less than a minute when he heard the sound of their garage door opening. It was Connie. Her class had been canceled and she was back early. Rick screamed out to her desperately trying to alert his wife to the danger in their house. The intruder then apparently turned his attention to Connie and he and Rick were in a race to reach her first. In the struggle, Rick was pushed down the stairs and was briefly disoriented. The intruder managed to get past him and pursue Connie into the basement. Rick was able to pick himself up off the floor and rush to Connie's rescue, but it was too late. As he sped down the stairs, a gunshot rang out. It was so loud that his hearing was affected for several minutes afterward. The intruder turned his focus back on Rick where he overpowered him by using a certain pressure point that caused him to collapse. The next thing Rick knew, he had been partially tied to a metal folding chair with zip ties. The intruder had grabbed a box cutter from Rick's toolbox and inflicted superficial wounds on Rick's body with it. The intruder next grabbed a blowtorch, which he used to burn random items. He then tried to use the blowtorch on Rick, but Rick was able to use his free hand and grab the blowtorch from the intruder. He aimed it at the man's face and burnt him, despite Rick previously saying the man had a mask on. The entire ordeal lasted five minutes before Rick scared the man off after the blowtorch incident. Looking at the original timeline, this meant that it would now be no later than 9.05 a.m. Rick only calls the police at 10.21 a.m. State troopers were already on their way as a call had been automatically placed to them at 10, 16 a.m. from the security company regarding an alarm triggered at home. This alert gets sent to authorities immediately. So why did it not get sent after the alert that Rick allegedly saw shortly past 8.30 a.m.? The first to arrive at 7, Birchview Drive was a member of the Ellington but the storm door was still closed. He knocked with no answer and proceeded inside. He first noticed a light layer of smoke that hung in the air. The basement door was open and droplets of blood led from the basement toward the kitchen. The man followed the trail where he found Rick. Rick was still attached to the folding chair lying face down on the kitchen floor. Rick told the man that he is still in the house, referring to the intruder. The man quickly called for backup, reporting the crime as a home invasion and soon a flood of officers were on the scene. They focused on locating the gunman as soon as possible. The investigators started taking note of everything in the house. They took multiple images of Rick on the floor, showing how he had been tied to the metal chair. Curiously, it was only Rick's left hand and left ankle that was zip-tied. She had been shot twice, once in the stomach and in the back of the head. She was pronounced deceased at the scene. 
This was no longer just a home invasion. Canine units were soon on the scene, hoping they would show investigators which direction the gunman had gone in. But the dogs seemed only to be focused on one person, Rick DeBate. One of the dogs found Rick's wallet on the lawn outside, presumably where the intruder had dropped it while fleeing. Still, the dogs could not follow a scent leading away from the property. Instead, they led their handlers to the ambulance where Rick was being treated for his superficial wounds. From the get-go, investigators saw holes in Rick's story. Rick was taken to Hartford Hospital. This is where he was first questioned about the events that day. He described the intruder to the investigators and told them he had seen the man shoot Connie in the basement. After he said his version of events, the investigators had some follow-up questions for Rick. This was when they noticed Rick's story changing slightly, which is always a red flag. There was confusion about the alarm system when Rick saw the alarm alert and whether he had been the one who set it off. Initially, Rick said he left before Connie dropped the boys off. This changed to him saying he couldn't remember who left first. The next thing that changed was his explanation of the sound upstairs. Now Rick hadn't heard a sound when he first entered. Instead, he went upstairs and noticed the bedroom light was on. He then came across the intruder rifling through their closet. The next story change involved the staircase. Remember that Rick first said he was pushed down the stairs. Now he was saying he tripped down them. Most important to investigators was the gun story. The gun used to shoot Connie was a .357 Magnum. It was one of Rick's guns that he kept in the house. He first told investigators that he was unsure how the intruder got the gun from Connie. Now he said he saw Connie and the man wrestling for the gun. Pulled it from Connie and he then shot her. Oh, and the basement was also dark during all of this, apparently. Rick told investigators how he dragged himself up the stairs, still attached to the metal chair, after he regained consciousness. He found his cell phone and called for help all while calling out to Connie, hoping she would call back. Rick's injuries were conveniently located. The wounds to his chest were only found on his left side. And the wounds to his legs were all within reach of his right hand. This piqued the investigator's interest. He also had no injuries that would suggest he had been pushed or fallen down the stairs. The dried blood from the box cutter marks hadn't dripped down the edges of his legs like you would expect if the wounds had been inflicted while he was sitting on the metal chair. The other inconsistency that stood out to investigators was the lack of blood leading up the stairs. If Rick had dragged himself from the basement to the kitchen, you would expect to see evidence of that. Instead, only droplets were found on that path and the only drag marks were found in the kitchen. Rick seemed to have walked upstairs before collapsing in the kitchen. Investigators were also curious why Rick hadn't tried to check on Connie. The evidence shows he hadn't been near the body after she was shot, as the pool of blood near her body was undisturbed. Investigators wanted to find out exactly how an intruder was able to get into the home. They theorized they had entered through an open basement window as the rest of the house showed no sign of forced entry. But even this didn't make sense. The locks on the basement window were removed from the inside and just left on the windowsill. An intruder wouldn't have been able to access these locks from outside without leaving significant damage. After he said his version of events, the investigators had some follow-up questions for Rick. This was when they noticed Rick's story changing slightly, which is always a red flag. There was confusion about the alarm system when Rick saw the alarm alert and whether he had been the one who set it off. Initially, Rick said he left before Connie dropped the boys off. This changed to him saying he couldn't remember who left first. The next thing that changed was his explanation of the sound upstairs. Now Rick hadn't heard a sound when he first entered. Instead, he went upstairs and noticed the bedroom light was on. He then came across the intruder rifling through their closet. The next story change involved the staircase. Remember that Rick first said he was pushed down the stairs. Now he was saying he tripped down them. Most important to investigators was the gun story. The gun used to shoot Connie was a .357 Magnum. It was one of Rick's guns that he kept in the house. He first told investigators that he was unsure how the intruder got the gun from Connie. Now he said he saw Connie and the man wrestling for the gun. Pulled it from Connie and he then shot her. Oh, and the basement was also dark during all of this, apparently. Rick told investigators how he dragged himself up the stairs, still attached to the metal chair, after he regained consciousness. He found his cell phone and called for help all while calling out to Connie, hoping she would call back. Rick's injuries were conveniently located. The wounds to his chest were only found on his left side. And the wounds to his legs were all within reach of his right hand. This piqued the investigator's interest. He also had no injuries that would suggest he had been pushed or fallen down the stairs. 
The dried blood from the box cutter marks hadn't dripped down the edges of his legs like you would expect if the wounds had been inflicted while he was sitting on the metal chair. The other inconsistency that stood out to investigators was the lack of blood leading up the stairs. If Rick had dragged himself from the basement to the kitchen, you would expect to see evidence of that. Instead, only droplets were found on that path and the only drag marks were found in the kitchen. Rick seemed to have walked upstairs before collapsing in the kitchen. Investigators were also curious why Rick hadn't tried to check on Connie. The evidence shows he hadn't been near the body after she was shot, as the pool of blood near her body was undisturbed. Investigators wanted to find out exactly how an intruder was able to get into the home. They theorized they had entered through an open basement window as the rest of the house showed no sign of forced entry. But even this didn't make sense. The locks on the basement window were removed from the inside and just left on the windowsill. An intruder wouldn't have been able to access these locks from outside without leaving significant damage. Those close to Rick hadn't even considered the possibility that he had something to do with Connie's passing and they grieved alongside him. While they clearly had a main suspect, the investigators didn't want to lose focus on exploring all possibilities. The debates did have someone who would potentially want to hurt them. They had been involved in a long-standing legal battle with a contractor who worked on the house. Connie and Rick sued the man in small claims court after multiple problems with the contractor's work and Connie had even expressed concern about her safety. The man was difficult to deal with and Connie's car had even been vandalized twice in 2015. She believed the contractor was behind it. After these incidents, the debates installed their security system and purchased guns. The contractor even came up multiple times when friends of Connie and Rick were questioned after her passing. But this lead fell flat after the contractor was found to have an airtight alibi on the day of the crime and he didn't at all match Rick's description of the intruder. While no one other than law enforcement suspected Rick was involved in Connie's demise, many people noted odd behavior from him. He didn't seem to be grieving how you would expect. Not long after the incident, Rick placed a message on the neighborhood group asking everyone where they liked to get takeout food. This seemed off for a man who had recently lost his wife in such traumatic circumstances. As investigators peeled back the layers of the debate's lives, they uncovered some glaring financial issues. Money was going out faster than was coming in and Connie felt like all the responsibilities were resting on her shoulders. She told her close friend she was thinking about separating from Rick and even had a file on her notes app titled, Why I Want to Divorce. The reasons ranged from Rick's lying to his poor treatment of her and not being a good father to the boys and focusing only on himself. Money is often a motive in cases like these and in mid-January 2016, investigators found out about two life insurance policies for Connie and Rick. Each policy was for the hefty sum of $475,000. It turned out that only Connie's life insurance was still valid as Rick's had lapsed due to non-payment. Rick waited just five days to claim Connie's insurance money. He also received $75,000 from her employer a month after her passing. Over the next year, investigators slowly built their case against Rick debate. They executed multiple search warrants looking into both Rick and Connie's phone records, financial statements, communications with outside parties, security system data, and most importantly, Connie's fitted. Connie's fitted showed she had first been active at 7.52 a.m. on the morning of December 23rd. This was followed by an extended period of inactivity consistent with Connie driving to the YMCA, the search warrant stated. We know Connie arrived at the YMCA as she was spotted on surveillance cameras. Then her fitted again registered another 10 minutes of inactivity when Connie was driving back home. She was back at the house at around 9.20 a.m. From 9.37 a.m. to 9.43 a.m. she was stationary. Investigators believe Connie was just resting during this time. The next 20 minutes saw Connie moving around like normal. During this time, Connie posted videos from her phone to Facebook with an IP address linked to her house. The last time Connie's fit it picked up any movement from her was at 10.05 a.m. So why was this so significant? This information provided concrete evidence that Connie's life was not taken at the time that Rick stated it had been. Connie was alive and moving until 10.05 a.m., an hour after Rick said he had witnessed the intruder take her life. Once they felt like they had enough evidence to convict Rick DeBate, authorities arrested him on April 14, 2017. He was charged with taking Connie's life, evidence tampering, and giving false statements to investigators. Rick pleaded not guilty to the charges. The police had a 50-page affidavit that included the fitted information, 
Rick's contradictions, and his affair with Sarah. The news of Rick's arrest rocked the close-knit community of Ellington. No one had given a thought to him being responsible. Even Connie's close friends, who she had spoken with about her marriage issues, thought many people go through difficulties without it ending like this. His bail was set at $1 million, which he posted immediately. Despite the mountain of evidence, it was a while before the case was actually taken to trial. It had been postponed twice before it kicked off on April 5, 2022. From his arrest to his trial, Connie's case received a lot of media attention. It became known as a case that was solved by a fitted, which Connie's family didn't approve of. They felt that it took the focus off of Connie to get a catchy headline. While it seemed like the prosecution had a clear-cut case, the defense was able to bring forward some damning information. Unidentified DNA had been found in the home in six separate places. This DNA coincides with Rick's story about the intruder starting off in their closet, moving down the stairs, and ending in the basement. The other evidence that the defense used was the gunshot residue found on Rick. The amount found on him was insignificant. You would expect there to be much more had he been the one to pull the trigger. The prosecution was able to counter this by explaining that the test had been administered hours after the trigger was pulled, meaning his hands could have easily been wiped or washed during that time. The prosecution stated a clear motive from the get-go. Rick's life was falling apart around him, with Sarah's pregnancy and Connie thinking about leaving him. The pressure is mounting, the baby is coming, and the defendant's worst fears are going to be realized. Following the five-week trial on May 10, 2022, the jury deliberated for three hours before reaching a verdict. Richard DeBate was guilty of all charges. Connie and her family finally got justice after six and a half long years. Judge Corinne Klatt handed down a sentence of 65 years in prison. She called the crime a brutal, calculating, and incomprehensible act. Her sentence fell just a year short of the maximum penalty. While his lawyer did signal they will be filing an appeal, it is safe to say Richard will spend his remaining days behind bars. During the trial, Judge Klatt got to know the wonderful woman that Connie was. She was a loving mother, a hard worker, and a best friend to many. As Judge Klatt so beautifully put it, the world is truly a lesser place without Connie in it. Roger Scott Dunn was born on February 10, 1967 in Lubbock, Texas, one of two sons born to Jim and Mary Sue Dunn. Everyone referred to him as Scott. Scott was described as a jokester, fun-loving, and as a ladies' man. By 1991, the 24-year-old left the military and settled in Lubbock. He worked at MGM Electronics where he installed custom sound systems in vehicles. He loved working on cars and he had even won stereo installation competitions. He also bought, restored, and resold used automobiles on his own. Scott dated Laisha Hamilton. She was a 28-year-old waitress. On the evening of May 13, 1991, Scott attended a party at one of his friend's homes. Out of nowhere, Scott got seriously ill. He couldn't walk or drive home and slept at his friend's house. The next morning, Laisha came to pick him up so that he could rest in the comfort of his own bed at the apartment they shared at Oakwood Club Apartments at 5818 24th Street. The day after that, on May 15th, Scott was finally feeling well enough to get back to his work. His car was still at his friend's house, so he arranged for his friends to take him to work. He told Laisha about this arrangement. She made him tea and left for work. When his friends arrived at their apartment, Scott didn't answer. Laisha arrived home later and told his friends that he must have left while she was at work. Scott did not come home that night, and for the next two days, there was absolutely no sign of him. Laisha then contacted Jim Dunn, Scott's dad, who lived in Pennsylvania, and told them that Scott disappeared. Jim Dunn then contacted the Lubbock Police Department to file a missing persons report. Jim told detectives that it was unusual for Scott to leave his Camaro, nicknamed the Yellow Submarine, and his tools at work. When the police arrived at Laisha and Scott's apartment, Laisha immediately told the police that a piece of carpet was missing from underneath the couch. In Scott's bedroom, the police found that missing piece of carpet. It had been duct taped together with the carpet in the bedroom. A piece of carpet had been removed from the bedroom. Along the seam, the police noticed a rusty colored stain. It was clear that it was blood. There was another large stain on the padding underneath the carpet in one section. The blood on the padding had seeped down to the concrete below. It also looked like someone had cleaned blood off of the baseboard of the wall. The investigators used luminol to test the room. The room lit up. It was obvious that someone, presumably Scott, had suffered a violent attack. Investigators looked at Scott's life and the people he knew to see if anything stood out to them. 
Scott had a previous arrest for using illegal substances. At age 23, he was arrested in connection with a Domino's pizza robbery. The police followed up on this to see if anyone might have had reasons to hurt Scott because of the substances or money. They didn't find anything useful. Looking at Scott's relationship with Laisha, investigators found a lot of oddities. It seemed that Scott wasn't able to commit to Laisha as much as she would have liked. One month before Scott's disappearance, Laisha had learned that Scott was engaged to another woman. Investigators saw this as a possible motive. Could Laisha have seeked revenge against Scott? Scott's friends told investigators something worrisome about Laisha. A family friend of Scott said that Scott was afraid to break up with Laisha. Laisha's ex-boyfriends warned Scott that she could lather herself up into violent, jealous rages. Laisha continued to contact Jim to talk about the case. Jim taped all of their phone calls. For some reason, Laisha didn't really seem that interested in finding Scott. She often talked about his sports car. She even asked Jim if she could have it. Laisha told Jim that she didn't want the car but needed it. Laisha was clearly getting impatient about having to wait for the car. This was really odd behavior. Investigators learned that Laisha had a criminal record. She had been arrested in New Mexico for embezzlement. Investigators continued looking into the possibility that she was responsible, but then she actually came up with the first suspect. Laisha told Jim that she believed a man named Tim Smith was involved in Scott's disappearance. Tim lived near Scott and Laisha and became infatuated with her. The police went to speak to Tim at his apartment and saw that he was packing up to move. Tim willingly let the police search his apartment. When the police walked back out to the room where Tim was standing, they discovered that Tim had moved a roll of duct tape that was on his bookshelf. Tim claimed he didn't move anything, but the police found it hidden behind some books. The tape was sent in for forensic testing. Using infrared lights to look at different wavelengths and components of the tape, the results were that the tape from Tim's apartment were consistent with the tape used on the carpet in Scott's bedroom. On the side of the tape, triangular green carpet fibers were found, which were the same color as the carpet in Scott's bedroom. Unfortunately, without a body, there wasn't much else investigators could do, and the case went cold. Jim got impatient and set out to find answers himself. He met with a group called the Vitek Society. It's a group of 82 international forensic experts. The group is a members-only group that meets in Philadelphia to try to solve unsolved crimes. Jim met with Richard Walter, a co-founder of the group, to go over the case of his son. Richard immediately confirmed that Scott is not alive anymore. Furthermore, he was convinced that Laisha held the answers. Richard sent the information to Dr. Richard Shepard of New Scotland Yard. Dr. Shepard concluded that Scott's life was taken in his bedroom and had been struck multiple times with a blunt object. He conducted multiple tests and confirmed that with the amount of blood that was lost, no one could have survived. Richard Walter begged the district attorney to take this case to trial. Richard said that they didn't have a body but had a body part, the blood's connective tissue. Richard Walter noticed that there were unidentified hairs in the duct tape found in Scott's bedroom. It was sent in for testing and was determined to be hair from both Tim Smith and Laisha Hamilton. Smith and Hamilton were finally arrested three years after Scott disappeared in 1994. It is believed that Scott's life was taken in the early morning hours of May 16, 1991 while he was asleep. Scott was struck four times with a blunt object. Hamilton and Smith tried to clean up the scene but obviously left behind too much evidence. It is believed that Laisha wanted revenge after finding out that Scott had been seeing other women and was engaged. Smith probably helped Hamilton because she manipulated him and he was obsessed with her. They were tried separately and both convicted. Laisha Hamilton was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and Smith was sentenced to 10 years of probation. The jury believed that Smith was involved in helping Hamilton clean up and get rid of evidence, but weren't convinced that he was in the room when the crime took place. It's not clear why Laisha got such a short sentence, in Texas no less, but she had to serve it in full after losing multiple bids for parole. Laisha dropped out of sight once she got out of prison. Frustratingly, neither Hamilton nor Smith wanted to tell police where they put Scott's body. There was much relief in 2012 when Lubbock Victims Assistance Services got word to Jim Dunn that a work crew had uncovered skeletal remains in a sewage system near Scott's apartment complex. Dental records confirmed they came from Scott. On June 16, 2012, the Dunns buried him in a grave beneath a stone engraved with a likeness of Scott's Camaro. Jim was quoted as saying, I tell everyone that Scott came home for Father's Day. Lisa Zeger was born in Holyoke, Massachusetts on March 24, 1968, to parents George and Diane. 
she had three siblings, David, Lynn, and Sharon. Lisa and her family moved to Agawam, Massachusetts in 1974. She graduated from Agawam High School in 1986. While in high school, she played tenor saxophone and flute in the concert band. She had also been a drum majorette for the school's marching band for two years. Lisa worked for the school newspaper and literary magazine. After school, Lisa became a member of the National Honor Society and the American Field Service. In 1990, Lisa received a degree in elementary education from Westfield State College. Lisa was a communicant of Sacred Heart Church and taught confraternity of Christian doctrine classes there. Lisa loved to draw and often gave pieces of her artwork to her friends and family. She remained close to her family as a young adult and had a close group of friends. She had a boyfriend named Blair. He co-owned a house where many of their friends lived together. Lisa became a teacher's aide in the special education department at Agawam Middle School. It did not pay well, so she had to get extra work. One of those jobs was working as a clerk at Brittany Card and Gift Shop. She also worked at the Perry Lane Camp for four summers. It is a summer camp for residents of Agawam. April 15, 1992 started like any other day for 24-year-old Lisa Ziegert. It was just a few days away from Easter. After a long day of teaching special needs students, Lisa hopped in her car and drove over to her night job at Brittany's Card and Gift Shop in Ogwam. The 24-year-old with dark curly hair, freckles and blue eyes was scheduled to work until closing time at 9 p.m. Lisa spent most of her shift putting helium into balloons as shoppers filled their carts with gifts and decorations for the upcoming holiday. At around 5.30 p.m., an unexpected visitor walked into the store, Lisa's sister, Lynn. It was a rare chance for the siblings to catch up. They chatted about Lisa's job at the school where she was beloved by students and her future goals. After about half an hour, Lynn left the store and drove home, glad that all seemed well with her sister. The following morning, Lisa's co-worker, Sophia Maynard, showed up as usual to open the shop. When she spotted Lisa's white Chevy Geo Storm in the parking lot and saw that the store's open sign was still outside the door, alarm bells started ringing in her head. The front door was unlocked and the lights were on. A radio was playing in the background. Sophia called out Lisa's name but received no reply. She walked up to the cash register and saw that Lisa's car keys and purse were left behind. When Sophia walked into the storeroom to look for her friend, she noticed that the back door was open and several boxes had toppled over. Sophia began to panic. She ran out of the store and across the street to Alvin's sandwich shop. Something's wrong, she shouted. Call the cops. There were shoe markings on the back door and a small amount of blood in the storeroom. The police theorized she had been taken out the back entrance and into an alley. Two doors and a card rack were removed by police and taken as evidence. Interestingly, the cash register was undisturbed. It did not appear to be a robbery. Spent hours scouring the banks and watery depths of the Westfield River on foot and from the sky with a state police helicopter. They could find no trace of Lisa. Lisa had not reported to work at Agawam Middle School, which was unusual enough that the school called her mother. Her family then also started searching for Lisa. A police officer said that he saw that the lights of the shop were still a few hours before Sophia entered the shop. He did not call it in because he had to transport a prisoner. Lisa was last seen when she spoke to the owner of the carpet store next door for about 15 minutes around 7.35 p.m., an hour and a half before her shift ended. They commiserated over the parking problems at the shopping center caused by people using its lot when going to the nearby bowling alley instead of the stores in the center. Before he left, he told Lisa he would not be challenging any drivers because there are a lot of crazy people out there. The last transaction in the shop occurred at 8.20 p.m. Another customer arrived at the store at 9.05 but found it empty. She thought she heard a noise coming from the back of the store but left without investigating it. This meant that Lisa vanished sometime between ringing out the purchase at 8.20 p.m. and when the customer arrived just after 9 p.m. On April 17th, Agawam Police Lieutenant Robert Campbell told the press that the chances of Lisa simply walking away from the store were slim. He announced that the case was considered a kidnapping as their investigation had ruled out any other possibilities. Three days after Lisa went missing on April 19th, it was Easter Sunday. All 12 churches in Agawam passed out white ribbons for their congregants to wear. It was a sign of hope that Lisa would soon be found and of support for her family at their services that morning. 
Later that day at around 2 a.m., a man was hiking with his dog along a mud-caked path in the woods four miles from the gift shop when he stumbled upon what appeared to be a partially clothed body of a young woman. Based off of the clothing of the body and a charm bracelet on her wrist, the woman was quickly identified as Lisa Zieger. Lisa had suffered seven stab wounds around her shoulder and throat, some more than an inch deep, and another knife wound to her upper left leg. Her light blue denim skirt and blood-soaked white blouse were pulled down toward her ankles. The cuts on her hands led detectives to think she had not gone down without a fight. An autopsy would later confirm their hunch that she had been assaulted by a man. Police discovered male DNA and blood all over her clothes and body. After visiting the crime scene, Agawam police detective Wayne Macy sped over to the Ziegert house. He feared that if he slowed down at all, he would lose his nerve and leave the difficult task of informing Lisa's family to someone else. He tried to think of the least offensive word he can use to tell them that Lisa was not alive anymore. It turned out he did not have to come up with a euphemism. When Lisa's mother opened the door for him, she already knew based on the fact that he had come to their home. Lisa's funeral took place at Sacred Heart Church. More than 900 people were in attendance. Joseph O'Neill, the owner of Brittany's Card and Gift Shop, made the decision to permanently close the store. He had been considering doing so for some time, but the dismay he felt knowing Lisa had been taken from the store and the grief he felt over his employee's demise finalized his decision. After the crime, fear spread through the town. Young women from Agawam and the surrounding communities signed up for self-defense classes in droves and insisted someone walk them to their cars at night. Within two days of the discovery of Lisa's body, more than 300 women had filed permits to carry firearms or mace. Police offered check-ins at businesses that were open late to ensure the safety of the people working there. All eight members of the detective bureau at the Agawam Police Department were put on the case. The FBI provided resources for the investigation and the Connecticut State Police were brought in because of the proximity of the site where Lisa's body had been found to the state border. Lisa's case was worked on nearly constantly with investigators working shifts of 18 hours or longer spanning every day of the week. Investigators received many calls from residents with possible leads. One of those leads led them to Gary Scarra. Let me explain what that lead was. It started with Noelle Delorier. She was a 22-year-old nursing student living with her parents in nearby Longmeadow at the time of Lisa's slaying. She was gripped by Lisa's case. Day after day, she sat glued to the TV coverage of the case as police searched for the perpetrator. Nine months later, in January 1993, Noel was in a patient's house working as a home health aide when a breaking news update shot across the television screen. It was another local case that was unfolding in real time. Reporters were interviewing a man who said his infant son had been abducted. Noel realized she knew the man. The infant's father was Gary Shera, whom she had briefly dated while they were students at Longmeadow High School in 1986. A few days after seeing him on the television, Noel was surprised to pick up the phone and hear Gary's voice on the other end of the line asking her out to dinner. They had not seen each other since high school, but she remembered Gary fondly and agreed to meet him a few days later at Collegian Court. It's a historical restaurant and banquet hall in Chicopee, Massachusetts. During dinner, Gary pulled out his wallet and showed Noel a photo of his infant son. One month later, the mystery of the boy's abduction was solved when police found Gary's son living with his mother across the country in Seattle. What was once a kidnapping case was chalked up to a messy custody dispute. Through her attorney, Gary's wife Joyce McDonald made a startling claim to Agawam detectives. She told them that Gary was responsible for taking Lisa's life. She added that he had an obsession with the case. Agawam police had never heard of Gary Shara before. He had no criminal record and there was not any evidence linking him to the crime. Since the beginning of the investigation, detectives had been flooded with tips from angry former wives and girlfriends who tried to pin the crime on the men who had them wrong. Detectives quickly placed Joyce's allegations against her ex into that category and dismissed the tip. Even her own family did not take Joyce's claims seriously. She had a long history of alcoholism. At least one relative, according to news reports, said she was convinced Joyce was just being a crazy drunk. Weeks and months went by without a prime suspect in the case. When months turned into years and no other similar crimes were committed, residents began to relax. All but forgetting it seemed that the perpetrator was still on the loose. Mark Fowle worked the case from the beginning, starting in 1993 as an Agawam police officer with a 4 p.m. to midnight shift, during which he fielded phone calls and read the volumes of information about Lisa's slaying. 
In 2001, Mark had been recently promoted to detective sergeant and took the reins of Lisa's case. He was determined to revive it after the original lead investigator retired. Mark scanned through everything in the files. As a result of Joyce McDonald's claim, Mark asked to interview her former husband, Gary. Gary had declined an earlier request to sit for an interview, but this time he agreed. When Gary showed up at the Aguam police station a few months later in 2002, he was polite and cordial. After Mark asked him to submit a DNA sample to clear his name, things turned sideways. Gary refused to give a sample, saying he was scared of being secretly cloned. In the meantime, Lisa's family kept pressuring the police for answers. Her mother, Dee Ziegert, appeared on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. It led to a lot of new leads, but none of them were fruitful. Lisa's mother also organized charity golf tournaments to raise money for college scholarships and took part in candlelight vigils in her daughter's memory. We want people to know that we will not forget, we will not give up, she told a reporter. Someone knows something and we hope that they will have the courage to come forward. By March 2015, Noelle Delury found herself alone and struggling through a messy divorce. Heartbroken, she isolated herself for several months until her friend invited her to another high school reunion dinner. Gary Shara was there at the reunion. There Noelle and Gary talked all night and soon after started dating. Noelle believed she had finally met Mr. Wright. Gary had a steady job as a shuttle driver for Enterprise Rentals at nearby Bradley International Airport in Connecticut. He loved animals and was especially good with children. Noel thought he might be overcompensating because he had no contact with his own son who was living with relatives in Seattle. An orphan like the fictional Bruce Wayne, Gary had a deep affinity for Batman movies. He had a collection of Batman t-shirts. Gary's adoptive parents had taken custody of him as a small child after he had bounced from foster home to foster home in California. The family eventually moved to western Massachusetts for Gary's high school years. Soon after they started dating, Noel began to notice odd behavior from Gary. It seemed as if he suffered from anxiety around crowds. When they went to the Boston Marathon, he refused to walk through the police checkpoint and he was white with fear. As time went on, Noel began to wonder whether perhaps it wasn't the crowds he was trying to avoid, but police. One day, Noel recruited Gary to chauffeur her wheelchair-bound patient to the girls' senior prom at a local country club. After the dance, the teen struggled with a disability ramp and nearly fell out of her chair. Gary rushed to the girls' aid and saved her from landing onto the concrete sidewalk. The patient was okay, but protocol required Noel to call 911. When police arrived, Gary was nowhere to be found. Noel later learned he had hidden behind the transportation van while the officers interviewed her about the incident. By 2016, police were solving one cold case after another thanks to advancements in DNA evidence. With Lisa's case, that meant they were able to put together a digital composite image of the perpetrator, a man of European extraction with some freckling, dark eyes and black or dark brown hair. District Attorney Anthony Gall Uni said all evidence and leads previously developed in this case are now being evaluated in view of this new forensic development. The technology that we have put to use is at the leading edge of the industry. With their mission renewed, State Police Trooper Noah Pack and Detective Sergeant Mark Fowl once again began poring over the stacks of case files. They focused on 11 suspects who matched the new digital composite and had refused to provide a DNA sample when questioned. After taking the case to a grand jury, Anthony Gall Uni received a court order granting him permission to force any unwilling suspect to provide a DNA sample, including Gary Skira. On Wednesday, September 13, 2017, Noah Pack visited Gary's residence in West Springfield, Massachusetts. He lived with a roommate in a two-bedroom apartment on the first floor of a large two-family home. At the front door, Noah told the roommate he was there to see Gary. The man told Noah that Gary was not home but said he would relay the message. Later that day, Gary called Noel and asked if he could stay at her place for the night. Noel found the request a bit odd. Gary never spent the night at her home during the week while he was working, but he told her that the traffic around his street was intense because of the hordes of visitors flocking to the gates of the Big E Fair nearby and he was worried about being late to work the next morning. Gary arrived at Noel's home 20 minutes later and they settled into a relaxing evening of dinner and TV. The next morning, she woke up before dawn and got dressed for work while Gary slept. When Noelle returned home at 4.30 p.m. after an exhausting 10-hour shift, she noticed Gary had left his wallet, his watch, and a handful of coins on the kitchen counter. She tried calling his cell phone, but the device was shut off, so she couldn't even leave a message. 
Noel then noticed a clipboard belonging to Gary on the coffee table. Attached to it was a letter with Noel's name written on top in Gary's handwriting. Here's what he wrote, with a few words changed to accommodate YouTube guidelines. You are going to find out some awful things about me today. They will tell you I abducted, assaulted, and took the life of a young woman approximately 25 years ago. It is true. All of it. I had no intention of taking her life when I grabbed her. But events spun out of my control. And in the eyes of the law, it is all the same. I have never regretted anything so much. I always knew one day it would catch up to me, and now it has. I received a text from my roommate last night that the state police were at the house with important papers for me. That will be a warrant to take DNA and that will send me away for life. I have never really been or felt normal. From a young age, I was fascinated by abduction. I could never keep it too far from my mind for long. On that fateful day, I let myself do something terrible. I've never forgiven myself for that. I also never did anything of the like again. I hated what happened. I despised myself. I thought of turning myself in hundreds of times over the years, but I am truly a coward. Today it will all end. I will either take my own life or face the music, as it were, Gary Shara. The next two pages included Shara's last will and testament and also a letter to Lisa's family. In the letter, he expressed remorse for the slaying and wrote that he could never apologize enough for taking their daughter and sibling's life. I neither expect or deserve your forgiveness, he wrote, but I hope knowing who I am and knowing I am gone will bring you some closure and peace. I am truly so sorry. At first, Noel didn't believe it. She thought that he was having a psychotic breakdown and that he had only imagined committing this heinous crime. Even though she had her doubts, Noel knew she had to give the letter to the police. She scrambled into her car and drove to the Massachusetts State Police Barracks in Westfield. Noel ran into the station and asked to speak with someone working on Lisa Ziegert's case. Investigators were stunned when she showed them the letters. They had believed DNA would identify the perpetrator, but they never thought they would see a confession before a DNA test was performed. Police interrogated her into the night, asking hundreds of questions. Most important of all, where was Shara? After saying she was afraid that he took his own life and was hanging from a tree somewhere, Noel added that she still loved him very much. In Agawam, Mark Fowl got a call from the state police, jumped into his squad car, and raced to the barracks to read the letters for himself. He stayed silent as he digested every word. To Mark, the letters did not reveal a full confession. After all, Shara did not detail much about the crime. But it was clear to the veteran detective that Shara was attempting to clear his conscience. Mark Fowl then reflected on a visit he had paid to Joyce McDonald's relatives in Seattle where they told him she had received a music box like the one sold at Brittany's Carden gift shop from Shara on the night Lisa's life was taken. Detectives pinged Shara's cell phone and tracked its GPS coordinates to Stratford Springs, Connecticut. It was just past 10 p.m. when police found his black Honda Civic in the parking lot of Johnson Memorial Hospital. There was no sign of Shara, but he had left a note on the dashboard. To whomever finds my body, I apologize for any psychological trauma incurred. Paul Mass State Police, thank you. Hours earlier, Shara had swallowed a fistful of ibuprofen. But he immediately grew scared and walked into the emergency room where doctors pumped his stomach and admitted him overnight. He was then put into the critical care unit and once detectives arrived, they placed him under arrest as a fugitive from justice. Noelle waited outside her home while investigators searched each room for evidence. They took Shara's toothbrush and a full syringe of insulin used to treat his diabetes. They even searched the well under her house and the cereal boxes in the kitchen cabinet. In the end, the DNA results were conclusive. Saliva found on Shara's toothbrush tied him to the decades-old crime. In 2017, 48-year-old Shara was extradited from Connecticut back to Massachusetts, where police formally charged him with the slaying, aggravated assault, and abduction. It took Noel several months to work up the courage to visit Shara at the Hampton County Correctional Center. She waited for him on one side of a plexiglass partition until he arrived in a red jumpsuit and sat on a stool on the other side. Over the jailhouse phone, he attempted to make small talk, telling her that the food was not so bad and that his brother had sent him some books. After listening for several minutes, Noel stared into his eyes and unloaded. After she yelled at him, he just blankly stared back at her. He did not say a word. In 2019, 50-year-old Gary Scarra went to court and changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. He was given a life sentence with no chance of parole. In Agawam, Mark Fowl got a call from the state police, jumped into his squad car, and raced to the barracks to read the letters for himself. 
He stayed silent as he digested every word. To Mark, the letters did not reveal a full confession. After all, Shara did not detail much about the crime, but it was clear to the veteran detective that Shara was attempting to clear his conscience. Mark Fowle then reflected on a visit he had paid to Joyce McDonald's relatives in Seattle where they told him she had received a music box like the one sold at Brittany's Carden gift shop from Shara on the night Lisa's life was taken. Detectives pinged Shara's cell phone and tracked its GPS coordinates to Stratford Springs, Connecticut. It was just past 10 p.m. when police found his black Honda Civic in the parking lot of Johnson Memorial Hospital. There was no sign of Shara, but he had left a note on the dashboard. To whomever finds my body, I apologize for any psychological trauma incurred. Paul Mass State Police, thank you. Hours earlier, Shara had swallowed a fistful of ibuprofen. But he immediately grew scared and walked into the emergency room where doctors pumped his stomach and admitted him overnight. He was then put into the critical care unit and once detectives arrived, they placed him under arrest as a fugitive from justice. Noel waited outside her home while investigators searched each room for evidence. They took Shara's toothbrush and a full syringe of insulin used to treat his diabetes. They even searched the well under her house and the cereal boxes in the kitchen cabinet. In the end, the DNA results were conclusive. Saliva found on Shara's toothbrush tied him to the decades-old crime. In 2017, 48-year-old Shara was extradited from Connecticut back to Massachusetts, where police formally charged him with the slaying, aggravated assault, and abduction. It took Noel several months to work up the courage to visit Shara at the Hampton County Correctional Center. She waited for him on one side of a plexiglass partition until he arrived in a red jumpsuit and sat on a stool on the other side. Over the jailhouse phone, he attempted to make small talk, telling her that the food was not so bad and that his brother had sent him some books. After listening for several minutes, Noel stared into his eyes and unloaded. After she yelled at him, he just blankly stared back at her. He did not say a word. In 2019, 50-year-old Gary Scarra went to court and changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. He was given a life sentence with no chance of parole. Stephen Mitchell Adams, known to his friends and family as a hardworking and persevering individual, was a kind and empathetic young man hailing from eastern Oklahoma. His deep-rooted interests in higher education and engineering, as well as his inclination to take care of his family and protect those he loved, was cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved disappearance. In the hilly woodlands of Toluca, Oklahoma, on December 13, 2004, leaving all who knew him across Cherokee Nation and the entire county at large, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As I hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams and the troubling mystery near Ten Killer Lake. Stephen Mitchell Adams was born on August 4, 1978 to parents Carl Adams and Deanie Hayes near Weber Falls in Cherokee County, Oklahoma. Stephen was the third child becoming the youngest of three boys. His older brothers, Bradley and Chris, welcomed a younger brother with open arms and quickly fostered a healthy bond with the family's newest member. From birth, Deanie always spoke about Stephen's sweet brown eyes and his delicate love for everything and everyone he encountered. He was fascinated by people and displayed little shyness, smiling at strangers and rarely crying out. This bled into his childhood and adolescence when Stephen continued to live as a well-mannered boy, obedient, yet still his fun-loving, whimsical self. He knew how to make the people around him laugh. A natural class clown guaranteed to boost his classmates' spirits. His mother described him as a character never afraid to back down from a bit of weirdness to mellow out tense situations or simply just to make others feel at ease. People regularly told Stefan he would one day make a wonderful father as well as just being a faithful friend. When Stefan and his brothers were still in grade school, the family did hit a bit of a rough patch after Carl and Deanie Adams got divorced and the family split up. Despite this fracture, however, the Adams clan remained tight-knit, strengthening their bonds even amidst the hardships. Stefan and his brothers continued to perform well in school, not letting the distractions of life take them down nefarious paths. As he neared the end of high school and the beginning of adulthood, Stefan realized he could continue his academic excellence and attend college, an opportunity not necessarily readily available to all of his classmates in Cherokee County. He researched as much as he could the programs that interested him and prepared tenfold for a post-graduation career in engineering, eyeing job opportunities in management sectors. 
He ultimately chose Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas to pursue his passion. Prior to completing his degree, though, Stefan's life would take a drastic twist in his late teenage years, delaying his move to university. You see, Stefan met fellow Telequa resident Alicia Renee Sizemore, and the two quickly entered a relationship. Before long, Alicia discovered she was expecting a baby girl and the couple married. They moved in with each other as Stefan worked a few jobs here and there, but nothing that set him on his career path. Eventually, their infant daughter was born, who they named Cheyenne, and Stefan and Alicia became full-time parents. Unfortunately, however, the stresses of parenthood at such a young age saw the once happy couple's relationship crumble behind closed doors. Stefan and Alicia would get into frequent arguments and soon recognized their marriage was untenable with a baby girl to attend to. The couple divorced at the turn of the millennium. However, Stefan's troubles were far from over. After the divorce and on two separate occasions, Stefan was falsely accused of child molestation by Alicia and her family. Both incidents led to Stefan being found not guilty and the charges were dismissed, but Stefan was still plagued by disagreements with his ex-wife. Even though they had sorted custody battles in court, Alicia would not allow Stefan to visit his daughter on his own time and instead forced supervised visitations as Alicia fought for sole custody and to completely remove Stefan from his daughter's life. Nevertheless, Stefan persisted. While managing custody issues, he moved in with a cousin of his nearby the Northeastern State University campus where Stefan had finally enrolled to take college courses. He was doing quite well despite the other stresses of his life. And he had a good part-time job at El Chico, a local Mexican restaurant. He had the full support of his family behind him as the unfortunate disturbances shrouded his life and was able to start a much healthier relationship with his new girlfriend, Brianna Farr. It was looking like an uphill climb to fight for time with his daughter Cheyenne, but a climb Stefan was mentally and emotionally prepared to undertake. He had already made it so far in his young life and he'd be damned to let it all slip away. Tragically, however, despite Stefan's unshakable determination, his aim to build a better life for himself and his daughter was seemingly ended when, in the middle of December 2004, he vanished without a trace, bringing his fight for a career and a happy family to a screeching halt. Let's now turn to the timeline of events that led up to Stefan's unexplainable disappearance. The morning of Monday, December 13, 2004 begins like any other. Stefan Mitchell Adams awakes at his Telequar, Oklahoma apartment. He shares the modest living quarters with his cousin but keeps to himself most mornings. Stefan eats breakfast after sunrise and prepares for an important day. He has final exams for his autumnal semester at Northeastern State University later that day and is anxious to perform well. Stefan informs his roommate that he also has a shift at El Chico that evening and will visit his mother between class and work. He packs up a few books and school supplies, but leaves the majority of his possessions behind, not needing much for an exam across town. Stefan departs between 8 and 9 a.m. and heads towards Grand Avenue, where the NSU Tahlequah campus resides. Between 9 and 10.30 a.m., Stefan takes his final exam. At NSU, his classmates and professor alike confirm his attendance and report nothing out of the ordinary. At the same time, Stefan takes his test and from maybe as early as 7.50 that morning, eyewitnesses spot a man sitting in his truck at the Dollar General store located on East Downing Street in Tahlequah. This Dollar General is only a few blocks from Stefan's apartment and the man occasionally gets out of the car to walk around as if waiting for someone. One eyewitness asks the man what he's doing hanging around at the storefront, to which the man says he's a construction worker from Keys, Oklahoma, waiting for someone to pick him up. No one recognizes the man, and his activity is considered odd compared to the day-to-day -day traffic around the area. Back at the NSU campus at around 1.45 a.m., Stefan wraps up his exam and leaves his classroom. He hops into his white 1995 GMC Sierra single-cab shortbed truck with chrome bed rails, driving off NSU grounds and theoretically towards his mother's place in Weber Falls. Within the next 15 minutes, estimated to be around 11 a.m., the mysterious man at the Dollar General disappears and does not return. About seven minutes later, at 11.07 a.m., he picks up and the couple chats about Stefan's exam. He tells Brianna he thinks he fared well and is looking forward to wrapping up the semester. Stefan also informs Brianna that he is on his way to Weber Falls to visit his mother, Dini, but after he drives an unidentified man down to Keys. Stefan doesn't clarify if he knows the man or not, but Brianna hears a muffled voice in the background, assuming Stefan has already picked up whoever it is, most likely just a hitchhiker. 
Outside of this bizarre errand, Brianna claims Stefan sounds normal and in good spirits and doesn't think much else of it. This would be the last confirmed contact anyone has with Stefan Adams. At around 11.30 a.m., Stefan's cousin, who lived with him back at their apartment, tries calling Stefan's phone. The cell rings only twice before cutting to voicemail. Subsequent attempts to call Stefan's phone result only with voicemail options. From this point, his phone never rings again. Around the same time frame, between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m., Stefan is spotted by an eyewitness outside a convenience store in Cuxton, Oklahoma, south of Keys. He is by himself, the supposed hitchhiker nowhere in sight. Stefan appears agitated or upset by something, a different demeanor than one heard by Brianna just a short time before. He reportedly gets back into his car and drives northbound along Highway 82, the opposite direction of Weber Falls. This is the last confirmed sighting of Stefan Mitchell Adams. Monday, December 13th wears on and Stefan never arrives at his mother's house in Weber Falls. Despite multiple calls by her and other family members, no one is able to reach him. At 5 p.m. that same day, Stefan fails to show up for his evening shift at El Chico. Neither Stefan's supervisor nor his co-workers hear from him, a strange anomaly at odds with his usual punctuality. Later that night, when Stefan never returned to his Telequa apartment complex, his family reaches out to the rest of their family and various friends to check to see if Stefan had taken shelter with any of them. Again, they are unable to find Stefan's whereabouts and go to bed fearful of his fate. The following day on Tuesday, December 14th, Stefan's supposed disappearance reaches a new severity when he fails to show up to class for another exam at NSU. This is the final straw for his family who know that Stefan would never jeopardize his future by skipping a final exam. They file an official missing persons report with the Telequa Police Department. Investigators immediately start seeking out the hitchhiker Stefan told Brianna he was driving to Keys the day before. They also put out a be alone notice for any 5'7 Native American men matching Stefan's description as well as his white GMC Sierra truck. Over the next few weeks, law enforcement canvasses the hills and various landscapes of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and its surrounding communities. When the holidays come and go without any sign of Stefan, detectives begin approaching the case as a homicide investigation. They base this conclusion on the fact that Stefan left all his personal belongings behind, including his two inhalers, which he needed due to a severe case of asthma. At the same time, police look at Stefan's ex-wife and her family as potential instigators. Stefan had been due in court for a custody hearing on December 21st in hopes of reversing the supervised visitation rule. But the timing of his disappearance seems like more than just a coincidence. They interview Alicia Sizemore and have her take a polygraph test. She technically fails, but as we know, polygraph tests are famously unreliable and without any concrete evidence against her or her family, law enforcement let her go. Just after New Year's Day in January of 2005, Stefan Adams' family receives a vile phone call from an anonymous man who threatens to hurt the family if the investigation does not cease. Police are made aware of the call and the Adams family goes on high alert. However, no physical damage is ever brought forth against them. In 2006, rescue groups team up with law enforcement agencies to search the waters of Ten Killer Lake, a large and deep body of water located in the vicinity where Stefan was last spotted. The search only covers portions of the lake rather than its entirety and nothing of note is found. These dives are paralleled with ground searches at the Fort Gibson historical site, but they all prove fruitless in the end. Across the next few years, investigators scour the rest of eastern Oklahoma for any vital clues, but come up empty-handed. They keep tabs on Stefan's social security number, bank accounts, credit cards, and phone service, but none are ever used or activated, dating back to December 13, 2004. The case is left cold until July of 2011, when Stefan's father, Carl Adams, submits a petition to impanel a grand jury to the district courts of Cherokee County, asking for a special investigation into the disappearance of his son nearly seven years ago. The petition lists several factors contributing to the motion, including previously unheard statements that the man Stefan picked up at 11 a.m. on December 13 went by the name of Ronnie Meechling, who was tasked with delivering Stefan and his truck to multiple individuals. The petition claims that Meechling also wrote threatening letters from jail to Brianna Farr, Stefan's girlfriend at the time, demanding she keep her mouth shut about her missing boyfriend. 
The petition also claims that there are witnesses who saw Stefan beaten to death, that his disappearance was orchestrated by members of the Sizemore family, and the district attorney's office in Cherokee County refused to charge first-degree murder against any specific individuals or allowed the Adams family access to any investigative files or any pertinent information regarding the search for Stefan. The factual basis of these claims mentioned are neither confirmed nor denied, but the case is taken up by a grand jury nonetheless. Another five months pass by before the grand jury publishes their final report stemming from the special investigation on January 12, 2012. The report lists five major hypothetical conclusions in the overview of the grand jury's findings. The first being that they believe Stephen Adams is indeed a victim of homicide and that his body is located somewhere in eastern Oklahoma. Their second point states that Stephen's truck had been located parked, locked, and abandoned by the Illinois River the day after his disappearance, but that it was subsequently ransacked of its belongings, including Stephen's NSU textbooks, which were sold back to the university, before the truck was stolen a second time. The report also clarifies that while there were certain individuals who had motives to kill Stephen Adams, they could not discern the exact cause of death, but they felt those responsible actually appeared before the grand jury in court. Most crucially, the overview states that they do believe the killers will be brought to justice and that those who clearly lied under oath during the grand jury testimonies should be investigated and properly prosecuted by then-district attorney, Brian Kuster. The grand jury concludes their report with optimism that their investigation and later findings will help aid the search for Stefan's body and bring his killers to justice. Over nine years later, however, and neither revelation has happened. The case is still open, but there are no updates, no clues and no promising leads as of the present day. Whilst discussing the timeline of Stephen Adams' disappearance, we mentioned a man spotted in the parking lot of a Dollar General store the morning of the ordeal. As random as it may have seemed, the Dollar Store situation may be connected to the case in more ways than one. In fact, investigators have pleaded with the public to keep an eye out for the man who was seen there, who authorities aren't calling a suspect, but a person of interest. They believe he may have vital information to either the location of Stefan's body or could at least provide a better idea of what happened to him that chilly winter's day. The dollar store man is our major case point, seemingly at the center of this mystery. When the unidentified man was first sought out by law enforcement, a sketch was released along with a detailed description built from multiple testimonies of people who shopped at the Dollar General that morning. He was described as a Caucasian male. In his 40s or 50s, standing at around 5 foot 11 inches and weighing approximately 190 pounds, he was thought to have had either brown or salt and pepper colored hair obscured beneath a dark green stocking cap or beanie. Some people also mentioned that the man had a beard and a mustache of about 4 to 5 days worth of facial hair growth. However, this wasn't a unanimous testimony. Along with the green cap, the man also wore dark blue or black faded jeans, a tan-colored car hat jacket over a flannel shirt, and wore eyeglasses. His vehicle was estimated to be a black or other dark-colored 2000 Ford Ranger pickup truck fashioned with a silver toolbox in the bed. He never gave his name, only his destination and a basic reason as to why he was hanging around for such a long time. There are a few reasons why this is pertinent to Stefan's case. The first is the general strangeness of the predicament. Locals were quick to pinpoint the bizarre nature of the man's situation. There aren't a lot of middle-aged men sitting in parking lots of dollar stores waiting for rise to cities just a few miles away, especially before 8 in the morning in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The second is the location of the man. The Dollar General in question is found right next to Stevens' apartment complex in the 400 block of East Downing Street, less than a minute's walk away. Not only that, but police reports from the morning also detail another sighting of a quote, suspicious man snooping around Stephen's apartment the morning he went missing. It was never confirmed that the Dollar General man was also the man at the apartment complex. But the fact that the area had two strange interactions with an unidentified male at the same time make it truly baffling. The third reason this connects to Stephen's case is the timing of it all. Along with the parallel suspicious sightings, the Dollar General man timed his stakeout at the store to coincide with Stefan's departure from his home and his time spent at NSU campus. The Dollar General man also left the shop at the exact same time Stefan left class and right before Stefan theoretically picked up the hitchhiker, later reported to be Ronnie Meachling. It was never clarified if Ronnie Meachling was the Dollar General man, but considering the police are still looking for the man in the sketch, it is safe to assume they are two different people. 
So could this all just be a coincidence? Of course, there is nothing criminal about waiting in a parking lot for someone to give you a lift. However, when you start to list all the coincidences, it becomes too much to ignore. The Dollar General man was near Stefan's apartment on the morning of the murder. He went missing and never returned. He also told people he was heading to Keys, Oklahoma, the exact location where Ronnie Meachling or whoever the hitchhiker was told Stefan they were going. Is it possible the Dollar General man was working in tandem with others in an abduction operation? At the very least, it cannot be ruled out. He could have been watching Stefan the morning of the 13th and waited for him to leave for his exams. Then, when 11 a.m. arrived and Stefan never returned, he knew that Stefan had been kidnapped and at that point left the scene. Again, however, it is also possible that the Dollar General man is truly just a person of interest and had no involvement with the disappearance. Maybe the man is sought out by police because he had the best vantage point of Stefan's apartment the day he went missing and thus could be the only eyewitness to be able to describe the other male, who was seen snooping around that morning. It is impossible to label the Dollar General man's exact involvement, but considering the circumstantial oddities and overall suspicious nature of his activity, it is vital we find the man in the dark green stocking cap to take that next step in this investigation. Let's now turn to the most prominent theories surrounding the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams. Many of the earliest theories surrounding Stefan's disappearance involved an accidental death, theories that included no third parties or alleged killers responsible for the man's fate. Instead, these theories suggested Stefan ran his truck off a road on his way down Highway 82 towards Weber Falls to see his mother. These theories posits that Stefan drove the hitchhiker down to Keys and dropped him off without a hitch than somewhere on his journey. His truck may have started causing problems or broken down to a degree where it was still drivable but not necessarily safe to do so. This could have been when Stefan pulled over at a convenience store near Cookston where a passerby alleged they spotted Stefan acting flustered or in some sort of emotional distress. Maybe Stefan was upset about his truck, worried about having one more thing break down or go wrong when so much in his life was volatile at the time. And then after deciding to turn around because of his truck's troubles, he broke down again, but this time on one of the winding roads through the surrounding foothills. If this was the case and Stefan lost control of his truck and sped off the road, it is highly possible he drove into a ravine or steep drop-off that concealed his destroyed car and even worse, Stefan's injured body. When people think of Oklahoma, they usually imagine the flat plains and open pastures of prairie grass and farmlands. However, it should be noted that eastern Oklahoma is a more mountainous region of the state, featuring uneven terrain that could definitely contribute to such a scenario. Stefan was driving a 10-year-old truck at the time, so a random breakdown during a routine trip isn't out of the ordinary or unexpected. It also would explain why Stefan was heading northbound after he left the convenience store in Cookston when Weber Falls is in the opposite direction. If he felt more comfortable just heading back to Taliqua where a trusted mechanic could look things over for him, he may have simply decided to postpone his visit with his mother. All that being said, there are too many holes in the accidental death theory to be ignored. If Stefan was having car troubles and needed immediate help, why wouldn't he just call someone? He owned a cell phone and could have called a local mechanic or a friend to pick him up. On a similar note, if the car troubles were enough to disrupt his plans with his mother, why wouldn't he call her to let her know what was happening? Remember, at the same time Stefan was seen at the convenience store, his cousin was attempting to call him but only reached voicemail. Now certainly, Stefan was agitated at that point and may not have been in the best of moods to talk. But if he was in a bind with his truck, it surely would make sense that Stefan would at least answer his cousin's call and explain what was happening. On a larger scale, the accidental death theory doesn't make sense ultimately because of the fact that the truck was never found to begin with. Had Stefan driven off the road, he couldn't have gone very far after that. Even traveling at high speeds down Interstate 82, the trees and inclines surrounding the highway would have slowed his vehicle enough so that it wouldn't completely vanish into the woods. These lands were scoured by search and rescue teams and investigators, especially Highway 82. A large white truck would have been found. And if a random passerby found the total truck before police, they would have reported it, seeing as though Stefan's body would be inside. An entire pickup truck doesn't evaporate into thin air. And unless Stefan drove his broken truck deep into the wilderness after crashing it through a horrific injury, there is simply no reason why it wouldn't be found. Spinning on from these theories came another hypothesis that if Stefan didn't drive off the road by accident, he did it on purpose. 
Some believe that the life circumstances around Stefan had become too intense and led to a breakdown, which tragically then led to a suicide attempt. These theorists believe Stefan left his apartment that morning with the idea he would not return, explaining that was the reason he left behind all of his personal belongings, including his life-saving inhalers for his asthma condition. They continue, saying Stefan camouflaged his day to appear normal with final exams and a trip to his mother's house. When his girlfriend called after class, Stefan again hid his true intentions, presenting himself to be in good spirits. Then, he used the story about a hitchhiker to cover up his plans, giving himself an alibi, so to speak. This would explain why Stefan was then seen alone and upset at the convenience store. He had never actually picked anyone up and was struggling to cope with what he was about to do. The theories then speculate this is why Stefan's cell phone was ignored and eventually shut off. From here, there are dozens of sub-theories, with some suggesting Stefan drove into the nearby Ten Killer Lake on purpose. Others posit that Stefan drove off somewhere he knew he'd never be found to end his own life on his terms away from where his family could find him. However, we must follow up this theory with the fact that nearly every professional investigator associated with the case, including Stefan's family and closest friends, have rejected the idea that Stefan committed suicide. Too many people attempt to decipher one's mental state as being fragile and immediately label a disappearance as suicide. Yes, Stefan was going through immense difficulties and fighting to see his own child, but he was also determined and strong-willed and had already overcome so much. In short, he had hoped that his situation was ready to change, with a custody hearing to reverse supervised visitation in a mere nine days. To speculate without any concrete evidence that he killed himself simply because his current situation wasn't the smoothest of rides is an insult to his memory, especially when there are many other factors to suggest suicide is not the cause of death. Most contradictory of all is the fact that there were numerous purported threats against Stefan's family and his girlfriend. If Stefan had ended his own life, why would people who had a vendetta against him scare his living family members and threaten them with violence if the investigation wasn't halted? If Stefan's enemies saw that he had disappeared and they had nothing to do with it, why would they try and stop investigators from figuring out what exactly did happen? That would absolve them of any wrongdoing and that have nothing to worry about. Plus, there have been countless private detectives, law enforcement officials, and an entire grand jury who have all ruled Stefan's case to be that of a homicide. So it is reasonable to assume there may be yet more information that might not be available to the public that points directly to murder. It also makes little sense that all the bizarre behavior would take place within the same few hours on the same day Stefan vanished too. The suspicious sightings, the hitchhiker, the cell phone, Stefan's behavior at the convenience store. It all adds up to something more than a mere suicide attempt. So if Stefan was murdered, the question is, who could have done it? The idea of a serial killer doesn't really get tossed around much in Stefan's case, and it makes sense. There were zero known or unidentified serial murderers in the Telequa, Oklahoma area in the early 2000s or really the surrounding areas for much of that time frame and location. Our research did show there were a couple of criminals and small-scale killers around eastern Oklahoma in December of 2004, but almost all of them involved specific motives or victims not of Stefan's demographic or were obvious instances of the killer knowing their victim and not just a random murder as is too often seen in serial homicides. In fact, it's that exact type of crime, a killer killing because of a personal relationship with the victim that fits Stefan's case file best. As previously mentioned, Stefan did have a group of people who did not want him alive. And theorists believe it was this collection of characters who conspired to and ultimately did kidnap him. Remember, Stefan's ex-wife Alicia accused him not just once but twice of child molestation against their young daughter, Cheyenne. Both times the accusations were dismissed in court and Stefan was found not guilty. But that didn't stop the rest of Alicia's family from taking out their anger on Stefan himself. Deanie Hayes, Stefan's mother, told police after his disappearance that at some point between Stefan going missing and the court cases, Alicia's father threatened to kill him personally. Stefan never appeared too distraught or intimidated by the threats and never instigated any violence against the Sizemore family to protect his future with his daughter. Yet that didn't stop them from verbally abusing Stefan or stop Alicia from going out of her way to stop Cheyenne seeing her father. So beyond a clear motivation, what else could point to the Sizemores being responsible? Well, theorists are quick to point out that the last sighting of Stefan at the convenience store in Cookson was actually reported by a semi-distant relative of Alicia's. 
the woman who told authorities about Stefan's agitated demeanor and northbound departure in the wrong direction was Alicia's mother's brother's sister-in-law, or in simpler terms, the sister of Alicia's aunt-in-law. Now it's easy to understand how this might sound convoluted and somewhat irrelevant. Small towns across America are known for large interconnected families, where scratch anyone and their kin to anyone else. Yet it has led some to wonder if this eyewitness was a part of the Sizemore family that held disdain for Stefan, could they have made up the sighting to throw off police? Maybe this person did see Stefan at a convenience store, but lied about him being alone to give the hitchhiker or Ronnie Meachling an alibi, or at least absolve them of any wrongdoing. Or maybe this eyewitness lied about the direction in which Stefan drove so that detectives would look in the wrong places for his body or his truck and at least slow down the investigation. However, it is still entirely plausible that even if the witness was giving a false statement to aid her extended family, parts of the sighting remain true. The part which makes the most sense is Stefan's odd behavior. His obvious discomfort and agitation for telling what was about to happen, whether he knew outright what it was or not. Again, it must be stated that just because this eyewitness had a relation to Alicia and her family does not mean she was lying or covering up a murder. That is an extremely heavy accusation to make with pretty much no evidence other than a rough, distant relation to someone we know wanted Stefan out of the picture. Also, if the Sizemores included a relative so far down the family tree in their scheme, that would most likely mean there were plenty of others in the family who knew of their dastardly plot too. Maybe the eyewitness was closer to Alicia than just being her mother's brother's sister-in-law, but there is still an enormous amount of doubt surrounding her potential role in a murder conspiracy. Could she be one of the people who lied under oath during the grand jury inquiry in 2011? That too is a distinct possibility. Aside from the convenience store witness, the other suspects in the investigation aren't as clear-cut as to what they mean regarding Stefan's fate. It's still unknown whether or not the Dollar General man was ever located. And if so, what detectives learned about his time spent in Taliqua on December 13th. It's also still unknown how Ronnie Meachling, the supposed hitchhiker, fits into the investigation. The man wasn't identified until Carl Adams, Stefan's father, listed his name in the petition for the grand jury in 2011 and claimed that Ronnie told people his role in the disappearance was to hitch a ride with Stefan and then, quote, deliver him and his truck to another group of individuals. Who these people were has also never been clarified. Brianna Farr told police she received a letter from Ronnie from jail though advising her to back off from the case, but it also hasn't been made public why Ronnie was in jail in the first place. Was it for his connection to Stefan's disappearance or a completely separate issue? We have searched for Ronnie tirelessly across the internet and databases, but found zero matches. Could it be his name was misspelled in a court report? Could it be that Ronnie Meachling is an alias for someone else? And on that subject, is Ronnie Meachling also the Dollar General man? They never appear in the same vicinity together in the story and the Dollar General man's movements align perfectly with Ronnie's entrance into the scenario. Again, these answers have not been provided by investigators. Maybe they think that by releasing Ronnie's full profile, it will hamper their investigation. But from our perspective, the official investigation has been stalled for nine years now. And the haze surrounding Ronnie Meachling makes it very hard to get a full grasp on the case at large. Technical details aside, theorists who believe Stefan was kidnapped and murdered by someone associated with Alicia and her family tied it all together like this. Stefan was supposed to be kidnapped at an earlier date, like the grand jury reported, but those plans fell through and they were redirected for December 13, 2004. A man, either part of the Sizemore family or paid by them, later known as the Dollar General Man, is recruited to spy on Stefan's apartment that morning. He arrives at the Dollar General at around 7.50 a.m. and begins to stake out the area, waiting for Stefan to leave. During his time spent in the parking lot, he also wanders over to the apartment complex himself and snoops around, making him the man who was later reported to have been spotted near Stefan's home that morning. Then, when Stefan left for class, the Dollar General man stayed put, making sure. Stefan did not return home earlier than expected. At 11 a.m., once it was confirmed the coast was clear, the Dollar General man left, his job done. This is where Ronnie, or the hitchhiker, as we'll call him, enters the plot. On Stefan's route home, possibly where Stefan parked his car on NSU's campus, the hitchhiker introduces himself to Stefan and asks for a ride to Keys. Knowing Keys is on his way to Weber Falls, Stefan agrees and calls his girlfriend. When Stefan tells Brianna everything is okay and hangs up the phone, the hitchhiker probably asks to use the phone himself. This is where the hitchhiker most likely calls the people he is delivering Stefan to. 
The hitchhiker then holds onto the phone after he is done. And when Stefan's cousin attempts to call, the hitchhiker either turns the phone off or destroys it, using a gun or other means to hold up Stefan. The hitchhiker has Stefan drive off into an unknown part of town or secluded location where they are then intercepted by others who take Stefan's truck, kill him, and dispose of his body. They dump the body somewhere in the eastern Oklahoma wilderness and drive the truck to the banks of the Illinois River where it is ransacked and stolen the following day. Everyone involved gets out clean and the police are left with a massive case void of clues. In this theory, the sighting at the convenience store is considered a red herring fabricated by those responsible. To date, this is perhaps the most plausible theory drawn up by investigators. It includes crystal clear motive, suspicious characters, and fits the timeline of events. It may seem a stretch to believe that a little family in a little town in Oklahoma could concoct such a horrific scheme and also get away with it. But remember, the grand jury themselves said they felt like they knew who killed Stefan and those responsible had testified before the courts. This was almost certainly referencing the Sizemore family since they were known to be involved with the hearings. At this point, it comes down to physical evidence being procured by cold case detectives and or combined with an admission by a member of the family or guilty party. Until that happens, this remains just another theory like all the others regardless of how well the pieces seem to fit the puzzle. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Stephen Mitchell Adams' unsolved disappearance, we want to make known that our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each episode, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In Stefan's case, we find it relatively obvious how Stefan disappeared via kidnapping and then most likely murder. There are too many factors to suggest Stefan ended up the victim of foul play, let alone the numerous conclusions reached by professional investigators and the Cherokee County Grand Jury. Frustratingly, they reveal a lot about the case while simultaneously not revealing much at all, at least in terms of specifics. But they do lead us to believe police have their prime suspects lined up in sight and are just waiting for the physical evidence to surface so irreversible arrests can be made. Who those suspects are is easy to define and is definitely the people who call to threaten Stefan's family, both before and after he vanished. Sometimes it is all too easy to get lost in cold cases and try and link victims with far-fetched narratives about random killings. But when there is a clear-cut motivating factor behind people connected with Stefan, it is logical to assume they are the guilty party. Of course, they are innocent until proven guilty, but in terms of building a hypothesis, the people who literally called for Stefan to die prior to him going missing are most likely the ones who did it. So if they did, how was it done? The final theory we mentioned in the previous segment sums it up best as we believe the Dollar General man was staking out Stefan's apartment and complicit in the crime whether or not he was the actual killer. We believe Stefan did indeed pick someone up after finishing his exam. And even if the man's name wasn't Ronnie Meachling or if Ronnie Meachling doesn't actually exist, we believe they held Stefan at gunpoint and directed him towards his fate. Then after the murder, they disposed of his body in a place no one will ever find and dumped the white GMC pickup truck near the Illinois River, per the grand jury's findings. We wish investigators would continue looking for the people who looted the truck and resold Stefan's textbooks back to Northeastern State University because they too could hold vital information regarding evidence left behind. The killer could have left DNA and fingerprints in the truck. And while those have most likely been lost to time over the last 16 years, there is always a chance and chances are worth clinging to in times of desperation. Thus, we ask that anyone with any sliver of information related to Stefan's disappearance, his truck's disappearance, or the situation at large to please call the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation at 800-522-8017. We also want to take a quick moment and acknowledge the complicated issue regarding the accusations of child molestation against Stefan. We do not want to minimize these types of accusations, but rather clarify we are simply reporting what was found by two separate courts in the matters. Each accusation was dismissed in court and heavily refuted by both Stefan and his family. Therefore, that is how we present the research. Tragically and far too often. Ideas that women lie or fabricate their stories about neglect, abuse, and rape are shared and believed. These are incredibly serious topics and are very real and never to be minimized. Also, just because someone's case is dismissed by a judge does not mean they didn't do something. 
and that is why every instance is unique and should be handled with care and respect no matter how you feel about the accuser. However, in the end, cold-blooded murder is never justified, and Stephen Mitchell Adams did not deserve to leave Earth so soon and without a trace. He was a hard-working young man who fought tooth and nail to provide for his family. He was a free-spirited presence who loved to laugh and, more importantly, entice others to join him in the laughter. Stefan was well on his way to management within the engineering sector and would have made a wonderful leader among his peers. Needless to say, he had a bright future, a future cut to darkness far too soon. His family does not deserve to dwell in that darkness any longer. Therefore, it's up to us to rekindle the fire that will light the way towards his discovery, illuminating the mystery of Stephen Mitchell Adams and his final drive through the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. Immaculate Basil, nicknamed Mackie by friends and family, was a compassionate and empathetic woman from the Couche Reserve in British Columbia, Canada. Her unmistakable laugh and deeply woven care for children were cut short by an unexplainable unsolved disappearance in June of 2013, leaving all who knew her across the village of Tash and the entirety of the Couche Reserve at large, grasping for answers in a sea of mysteries. That drowned us all in doubt. In the hope of providing more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of Mackie Basil's disappearance in Tash, British Columbia, and the harrowing story of murder, mayhem, and missing indigenous women in rural Canada. Immaculate Mary Basil was born on December 8, 1985 to parents Samuel Basil and Patricia Joseph in rural British Columbia, Canada. The day marked the Roman Catholic holiday, known as the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a celebration of the Virgin Mary. Samuel figured there wasn't a more befitting name for his newborn baby girl than one signifying the holiday and Immaculate received her namesake. It didn't take long for the nickname Mackie to originate and the newest member of the Basil family was welcomed with a burgeoning identity. Mackie and her family were raised in Tash, British Columbia, a First Nations village located in the vast woodlands of rural Canada. The town belongs to the Tlazden Nation on the Kuzche Reserve, where a group of indigenous peoples called themselves Dakel, translated to people who travel upon water. It contained one road in and out of the village and hosted a population of just 400 people resting on the lake called N.A.K. Alban, also called Stewart Lake. Tasha's close-knit community spent their summers foraging in the mountains and catching fish in the waterbed. Winters were brutally cold and heat sources were scarce, but the people who called it home didn't flinch and survived as best they could. Mackie grew up in a mostly stable home for the first few years of her life, watching as the family grew. She was the third of eight siblings with older brother Peter, older sister Ida, and younger sister Crystal, forming the clan of her early years. The siblings got along fantastically and were well on their way to enjoying wonderful youths under a stable roof. All of this changed, however, when Mackie was just four years old. Her father, Samuel, was caught in an adultery scandal and ended up leaving the Basel household to live with another woman. The incident crushed Mackie's mother, Patricia, who had covered up immense pain and struggles of her own for decades. Patricia had been a victim of a Lejac residential school during her youth, where her identity and culture as an indigenous woman were stripped from her as she withstood abuse and neglect from her country. These traumas combined with her ex-husband's infidelity led to a severe bouts of alcoholism and the family struggled to move forward. At first, Mackie's brother, Peter, took the reins in attempting to care for his younger siblings. Being a teenager at the time, he could at least find casual work around the reserve and come up with basic resources for Mackie and her sisters. But it didn't suffice in the long term. Eventually, a ward for the welfare division in British Columbia arrived at the Basel household to take the children away from their mother and into foster care as arranged by the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Mackie's life took a terrible turn for the worse once put in foster care. In the first couple of years, she was able to stay under one roof with her sisters, Crystal and Ida. The three looked out for each other as they were exposed to the torment of uncaring foster parents. In one household, they were fed spoiled food and forced to undress in public when they would get dirty from playing outside. Eventually, Mackie and her sisters were separated into different foster homes. While it was a crushing blow to their overall well-being, the siblings remained in contact with each other. They still attended the same school and met up during lunchtime. And if they weren't in class, the girls would call each other at 10 a.m. every day. The separation hurt Mackie the worst, though. 
At the time, her parents were nonchalant with the styles of the period and dressed Mackie in outdated clothing, often leading to bullying at school for both her attire and her thick regional accent. After a few years of isolated foster care, the three sisters were finally put back in the same home. Once they all reached adolescence, the reunion was anything but sweet, however. Once the girls matured, their foster parents, more specifically their foster fathers, would commit acts of sexual abuse and assault. Ida and Mackie, fearing for their youngest sister, Crystal, would go out of their way to take the brunt of the violence. Mackie especially received a high percentage of this abuse, be it physical or verbal, without anyone to turn to. Mackie and her sisters internalized the trauma and fought to survive a system set up against them. Over time, the Basel children found ways to reunite with their eldest brother, Peter. Sometimes Mackie, Ida, and Crystal would be placed in hotel rooms for weeks on end rather than official homes. And they'd use their allowances to hop on a bus and travel north to visit Peter. If the bus wasn't available or money was tight, they'd hitchhike instead. Regardless of how she got there or what she had to do to make it possible, Mackie fell in love with the idea of reconnecting with her roots as an indigenous woman and with the family she was separated from so many years ago. She wanted to familiarize herself with her tribe's history and the culture she never got to experience. These dreams were realized when Mackie graduated high school and moved back home to Tash. She started a family with her partner at the time, the father of their newborn baby boy named Jameson. While in Tash, Mackie gained employment at a local school working as a teacher's aide and receptionist for the band office. She even did nominal cleaning assignments around the reserve but mostly dedicated her time to nurturing her son. Hoping to provide a better living situation for other youths around the Kuzche Reserve, Mackie also fostered a few children who needed care themselves. Knowing the horrors of her own past were still taking place around the greater BC area, Mackie did her best to save the soul still growing and learning around the village. When she wasn't taking care of her kids or working tirelessly at school, Mackie was finding creative outlets, whether that be drawing or coloring or coming up with vibrant and beautiful decorations for the holidays and celebrations held with family members. She adored music and went home alone would blast it from her front porch, finding songs that represented the courage, strength, and perseverance she displayed since a young age. Mackie ended up separating from her longtime partner and the father of Jameson. Needing a place to stay, Mackie moved in with her brother Peter and his wife Vivian. Here she would help Vivian forage for food in the nearby hills and cook various meals for her son, nephews, and anyone who stopped by. In a sense, she was following the footsteps of her late mother who had been struck and killed by a tractor trailer in 2006 and was on her way to confronting her dark past and healing from the trauma hanging over her like a storm cloud. Yet in a cruel and wicked twist, these efforts were halted when Mackie disappeared without a trace after attending a summer party in the middle of June 2013, creating yet another resounding echo of silence and tragedy in the small town of Tash. Let us now turn to the timeline of events leading up to Mackie's disappearance. In 2012, Mackie Basil and her boyfriend of a few years split up after living together with their newborn son, Jameson. Mackie moves in with her brother and sister-in-law while maintaining full custody of her son. While she isn't at Peter's house full-time, it's where she spends a bulk of her free time, rarely going out and keeping to her introverted personality. Fast forward to June of 2013, about one week before Father's Day. Mackie asks Peter to take care of her baby on multiple occasions, promising to return. What she's referring to isn't fully understood, but Peter senses an irritation or anxiety bubbling to Mackie's surface. A few days later, on Friday, June 13th, Mackie goes shopping with Peter and Vivian. There they buy groceries, including two 26-ounce bottles of vodka that Mackie asks Peter to purchase for a party that night because she's misplaced her identification. Afterwards, they head back home to check the mail. That same evening, around 5 p.m., Mackie attends her aunt's funeral with members of the Basel family. Soon after the funeral ends, Mackie returns to Peter and Vivian's residence. She showers and changes into fresh clothing, including gray leggings, a blue t-shirt, and a black hooded sweatshirt with a maple leaf design on the front. A few minutes later, right before she departs for her party, Mackie makes sure to pack her navy blue iPod shuffle and headphones with one bottle of the vodka so as not to be without music. She also finds Vivian and tells her she'll return to the house the following day to take Jameson and her nephew to the park to play. Just as the sun touches the horizon and dusk begins to fall, Mackie departs Peter's home in Tash. She heads to the party on foot to a remote cabin in the Kuzche Reserve Woodlands, a 20-minute walk from the Basil House. 
Just after midnight on Saturday, June 14th, Mackie arrives back at her brother's place. She picks up the second bottle of vodka and leaves once more, but not before saying goodbye to Peter and telling him, I love you. Peter follows Mackie outside and she explains she's with two men, a man by the name of Victor and her cousin, Keith. Peter watches as Mackie walks up the path that runs alongside his house and up into the thick of the trees. Mackie climbs into a pickup truck driven by Victor and Keith and they head back to the party. Peter feels a twinge of strangeness about the whole ordeal. This is the last confirmed sighting of Immaculate Basil. Later that night, Mackie allegedly rides with Victor and Keith as they retrieve red roofing tin from another hunter's cabin on the reserve. At some point in their journey, the white and blue pickup gets into a minor accident on the Leo Creek Forest Service Road around an area colloquially called 16 Kilometer. At around 9.30 a.m., a forest worker driving down the same service road makes a sighting of a single long-aired woman walking over a bridge in the opposite direction of a disabled pickup truck. The worker also spots two men with the truck who pay no attention to the long-aired woman. About 30 minutes later at 10 a.m., three witnesses named Vanessa, Joseph, and Ron C. Victor walking through Tash, his clothing soaking wet all the way up to his chest. Around the same time, the Basil sisters began to worry as Mackie misses their daily phone call. They want to call their brother, Nick, who sometimes hosted Mackie, but neither she nor Nick own a phone. Nick's home was too far to reach by foot also, so the sisters stay home. 24 hours go by and at 10 a.m. on Sunday, June 15th, Father's Day in 2013, the Basel family's worries escalate to a real fear that something has happened to Mackie, still having not heard from her. Vivian and Mackie's two sisters call people around the community asking if anyone had seen or heard from Mackie. The following day, on June 16th, Crystal and Ida finally connect with their brother Nick, who informs them he never saw Mackie in the days leading up to Father's Day. Another day passes with no new information coming forward. And on June 17, 2013, Crystal files an official police report with the RCMP. Authorities arrive at the Basil home the next day. On June 18, where they interview Crystal. They kick off their investigations with interviews of anyone suggested to be at the party Mackie attended on the evening of June 13, simultaneously. The Basil family round up nearly 300 volunteers from both Kush and the surrounding reserves to form a search camp and comb through the woodlands in the hope of finding Mackie. They begin their search at the same bridge where the forestry worker made their sighting of a long-haired woman. A day after the volunteers established their campground, the RCMP joins them with their own official search and rescue squads equipped with search dogs and radio instruments. Over the next couple of weeks, both parties discover various objects strewn throughout the forest, but nothing of notes or connection to Mackie Basil. At some point during the initial search missions, Peter and Vivian woke up at the volunteer campgrounds to find their tent had been slashed open. In the middle of the night, as the investigation makes no grounds, rumors around Tash begin swirling, involving the two men last thought to be with Mackie, Victor, and Keith. One rumor in particular strikes the Basel family as odd. Apparently, the truck driven by Victor and Keith had been scrubbed rigorously with bleach in the days after Mackie disappeared. It doesn't take long before the gossip reaches the RCMP investigators, who clarify they've interviewed both Victor and Keith. The RCMP also reveals both men passed polygraph tests and when they took possession of the truck in question, they found no signs of either foul play or bleach. They also announced Victor and Keith remained cooperative during their investigations and a forensic psychologist was brought in to observe their behaviors, which were also cleared. Sometime afterwards, Vivian Basil makes personal contact with Keith and Victor, who tell the Basils they aren't 100% sure what happened but think Mackie hitched a ride from someone other than them the night of the party. Without many other leads to chase down, police turn to Mackie's ex-boyfriend. No one knew the exact reason why Mackie and her partner broke up and the police never announced an official answer. However, they do learn of an alibi Mackie's ex had to explain his whereabouts the night of June 13th. The RCMP corroborate this information and determined the man was too far from Tash to be considered a person of interest. Not long after, law enforcement runs out of clues. They tell the Basel family that without a crime scene, there cannot be official suspects. However, they do believe foul play cannot be ruled out and that anyone could be culpable for taking advantage of a young woman alone at night. In the years since Mackie went missing, the Basel family and remaining members of the Tash community rely on their own methods to learn of Mackie's fate.
They use dreams and their symbolism to look for clues, like following channels of water or watching the animals in the trees as their guides. The family especially likes to watch true crime television in hopes that they will be inspired when thinking of potential leads or similarities in other cases. They even go as far as to contact a psychic who tells them one day someone will come forward with pertinent information. Meanwhile, the remote cabin where Mackie attended the party is searched endlessly by both investigators and volunteers. It deteriorates into a half-standing structure and becomes a home for spider webs and strewn materials left by a logging company operating in the vicinity. As of the present day, the community of Tash is still in utter disbelief regarding Mackie's unexplainable disappearance. Their close-knit connections and sense of togetherness was shattered, and the lack of closure or any reasonable answers has left many of them deeply hurt by the tragedy. And yet, the Basil family still believes someone in their village is responsible and haven't given up hope that the truth will be revealed. Like many cases across rural Canada involving the disappearance of First Nations women and children, there are few clues or points of emphasis in Mackie Basil's case file. So much of the information is already murky with little verifiable facts or indisputable data made public by the assigned investigators. While this is understandable to a degree, considering authorities keep certain details classified as to not interrupt the cadence of an investigation, nearly nine years has passed since Mackie first vanished. And we still don't have much testimony or physical leads that help paint a picture of what exactly we are dealing with. That being said, one major eyewitness account stands out from the rest with head-turning observations that may have more subtext than originally thought. This case points comes from Vanessa Joseph, a relative of Mackie's on her mother's side. Vanessa was interviewed not long after the investigation went underway and she had some interesting things to say about the party on the evening of June 13, 2013, and the two men last spotted with Mackie alive. Vanessa stated that while she doesn't know the exact number of people attending the party at the remote cabin that fateful evening, she does believe it included mostly Mackie's cousins and fellow relatives, all people of an inner circle where everyone knew everyone. Vanessa included in the statement that she personally knew who Victor and Keith were, despite not having close relationships with either man. Vanessa also felt the circumstances surrounding Mackie's disappearance and the involvement of Victor and Keith were suspicious and left no stone unturned. She visited the supposed crash sites where the pickup truck disabled at 16 kilometer on Leo Creek Forest Service Road. She revealed that she did find parts of a truck stood near a tree that had broken in half, believing that at very least there had been an automobile accident of some kind. Others believe the truck simply got caught in the mud. But at least there were bits and pieces of the truck left behind to prove that something happened. Vanessa kept digging and discovered that after Victor and Keith's truck crashed at 16 kilometers, they tried to wrangle a black truck, owned by someone at the second cabin where the red roofing tin was being held, so that it could come down through the woodland and tow the disabled pickup truck back to town. The issue with this explanation, according to Vanessa, was that the black truck never made it down Leo Creek Forest Service Road and into Tash. Rather, it was left behind at the hunter's cabin in the Koosh Woodlands, about an hour-long drive from 16 kilometer. What further complicates the situation is Vanessa's own sighting of Victor the morning after Mackie disappeared, where he had been seen walking through Tash at 10 a.m. with his clothes soaking wet up to his chest. If the timeline we've been given is correct, that means he made it into town just 30 minutes after he had been seen by the forestry worker at the crash site. So, if the black truck at the cabin never came down to tow the disabled pickup truck, how did Victor make it to downtown Tash so quickly? And why was he soaking wet? If a passerby offered to drive him into town, why wouldn't they just bring him directly to his destination and not force him to walk in wet clothing? Which is a question in its own right. What was he doing to be drenched nearly head to toe? If they were stuck in mud, there is no corroborating eyewitness testimony specifying his clothes were dirty or muddy. Unfortunately, while Vanessa's testimony is noteworthy and leaves inklings of suspicion, it complicates the investigation rather than clarifying it. She has since stated she believes everyone involved in the case has been properly interviewed by police and has no idea who could be responsible. Despite her comments on Victor and Keith, it goes without saying she isn't the only one. Let us now turn to the most prominent theories in explaining the disappearance of Immaculate Basil. To better understand the theories surrounding Mackie's investigation, it's important to take a closer look at the geography of Tash and the nature of rural British Columbia as a whole. Tash sits on the northern shores of Stewart Lake, British Columbia, properly named Lake Nicalbin. 
The closest, most heavily populated junction nearby is Fort St. James, 45 minutes south of Tash, connected to the reserve by Tash Road and Route 27. Between the two locations are plenty of lakes, smaller ponds, interconnected rivers, and hillsides featuring infinite backwoods. If an area isn't covered by man-made structures or bodies of water, it's covered with trees. There are no prairies or plains or open stretches of land. Everything is covered by the cloak of the forest. Due to the highly concentrated woodlands and rural nature of the area, the only major industries located near Tash are logging, forestry operations, and mining. An inactive railroad runs through the area as well, but went out of operation long before Mackie Basil went missing. Considering the lack of employment and the remoteness of the Kush Reserve and the surrounding communities, it's very possible the environment itself is to blame for Mackie's disappearance. A popular theory held by some, including investigators at the RCMP, is that Mackie vanished as a result of an animal attack. Just a few species that call rural British Columbia their natural habitats are gray wolves, coyotes, cougars, and both black and grizzly bears. All of these are distinct predators that if hungry or provoked are known to attack and kill humans under the proper circumstances. Thus, there is a reasonable point to be made that if Mackie was walking alone through the trees and under a night sky, she could have been unaware of a predator lurking behind her, or worse, pack of wolves or coyotes. Maybe Mackie had run into a bear cub and the protective mother was within striking distance to protect her young. Remember, Mackie was a music enthusiast and it is a known fact she had her iPod shuffle and headphones with her the night she went missing. If she needed to walk a lengthy distance, she was most likely listening to music to keep her company or comfort her during periods of loneliness and isolation. It would also help combat the creepy feeling of walking through a forest in the dark as well. If she did have her music turned up to a point of outside noise cancellation, she would never hear an animal making its approach, take into consideration the stealthy and quiet nature most predators have to begin with. And it's a recipe for a horribly tragic incident. The problem with an animal attack attributed to the case is the complete lack of evidence such an incident would produce. Had Mackie been attacked by a cougar or a bear, there would have been objects left behind, most likely traces of skin, blood, or bone strewn through the forest. While the woodlands around Tash are vast and seemingly endless, there were countless rescue missions that scoured every square inch of a 20-kilometer radius around the area Mackie was last seen. Animals kill on instinct. It is their nature to hunt and take their prey off to a secluded place to eat, either by themselves or with a pack. They are not wired to clean up after themselves, nor do they fully consume a corpse. There would be bone fragments left behind, not to mention the clothes Mackie was wearing. Every shred of fabric and personal belongings found in those British Columbia backwoods was forensically tested for DNA matches to Mackie, and nothing ever returned a positive match. While it's not ruled out completely, there simply aren't enough signs to suggest animal encounter or misadventure. Another potential theory put forth is the possibility that Mackie disappeared of her own accord, whether it be escaping to form a new life or potentially ending one via suicide. There isn't much circumstantial evidence to support this theory other than that there are few other explanations as to how someone could leave without a trace. Some would point to Mackie's behavior in the months and days leading up to June 13th. She left a long-term relationship with the father of her son out of the blue, never explaining how or why to her closest family and friends. She also asked her brother and sister to take care of her son on random occasions and specifically told Peter, goodbye, I love you twice on the night she left. To some, it sounded like a subtle way to make peace with her loved ones before leaving permanently. Others will argue that Mackie couldn't have ended her own life or left without notice because of her unconditional love for her son and other children she helped foster including her nephew. The sad truth of the matter is that for certain people who seek out suicide or self-harm, it doesn't always matter who or what is in their life to provide love or happiness. Who's to say Mackie wasn't dealing with inner turmoil regarding her circumstances? What if she had to run away for her safety? What if someone threatened her or her son if she didn't leave? These are far-fetched scenarios that rarely happen, especially to public knowledge, but they should be addressed. And while there are at times signs of suicidal ideation in folks contemplating taking their life, there isn't any set rules or guidelines to picking those folks out of a crowd. There are people who appear perfectly content and at peace with their life, who are actually fighting internal battles and wind up ending things anyway. Mackie could have been one of those people. She endured years worth of abuse, assault, and neglect. She was abandoned by her father. 
And sometimes when anxieties of abandonment surround people as children, those same insecurities fuel them in adulthood. Those who suffer from fears of abandonment will often abandon others later on in life. Not because they are cruel people who want their loved ones to suffer, but because if they abandon someone first, it removes the possibility of that same person abandoning them later on. In the end, it's impossible to tell. And if it doesn't come directly from Mackie herself, the suicide or consensual escape theories are nothing more than guesswork. The third theory that makes the most sense in our eyes and the eyes of those involved with the case was that Mackie met with foul play in the early morning hours of June 14, 2013. Of course, this theory begs a vital follow-up question. If another human being or beings is responsible, then who is at fault for Mackie Basil's disappearance? The most obvious possibilities are Victor and Keith. If not for any reason other than they were the last two people who allegedly saw Mackie alive. Their testimony places Mackie at the 16-kilometer checkpoint on Leo Creek Forest Service Road in the twilight hours on June 14th, walking away from the pickup truck they crashed while on the way to a hunter's cabin for supplies. It is not public knowledge as to why she left the two men, but then again, she may not have told them why either. The men reported that after the crash, Mackie departed on foot, saying she was going to try and hitchhike her way back home and would find a ride elsewhere. It is unclear what time any of this takes place in the men's version of the story. The issue with Victor and Keith's testimony, accepted by law enforcement and passed by the untrustworthy polygraph test, is that only they can stand by such claims. There were no witnesses to the car crash situation outside of the forestry worker who was unable to identify the woman he saw as Immaculate Basil, or properly define exactly what was wrong with the truck on the side of the road. The police actually followed up with this anonymous worker and found his claims baseless. Making matters even cloudier is the fact that Victor didn't exactly have the most promising history. Not only was he much older than his counterpart, Keith, and Mackie Basil herself, but Victor also wasn't a Tash resident and had a somewhat lengthy list of prior criminal activity. The provincial courts in British Columbia officially have five separate violent crime convictions reported on Victor, as well as at least one charge of sexual assault. While the exact descriptions of these charges aren't known, it certainly paints Victor in a different light. It's possible he took advantage of Mackie, killed her, and threatened Keith with violence, as his past might indicate. Keith was younger than Mackie at the time and may have struggled to protect her under the prowess of a much older, larger man. Again, this is all assumption. Victor has repeatedly denied any and all claims in the matter and has technically been ruled out by the RCMP. The circumstantial facts don't make anyone necessarily feel good about that, but legally it's what we have and what we must go by. Both he and Keith are still alive to this day and the potential for additional information to come out still remains. While there is little public knowledge as to any known serial criminals or kidnappers in Tash, many people believe the potential kidnapper or killer is from the area. It would make sense too, given that Mackie was on rural, unmarked roads for most of the night and in a general area in which only locals would have known how to navigate without being seen. Who else it could be outside of Keith or Victor is impossible to discern with the information we have right now. Mackie also wasn't the first person to go missing from the general area in her own family. On September 8, 2007, her cousin Bonnie Joseph went missing while attempting to hitchhike to Vanderhoof from Prince George on Highway 16. While Bonnie was most likely the victim of a random hitchhiker, it does speak to how often these types of crimes happen to First Nations women all across Canada, specifically along Highway 16, dubbed the Highway of Tears. We've covered a few videos detailing Highway 16, and if you haven't heard of it before, we recommend educating yourself on the horrifying and tragic topic as soon as you can. As a quick recap, the Highway of Tears is a 725-kilometer stretch of highway, specifically Highway 16, connecting Prince George to Prince Rupert in British Columbia. Since 1970, it has seen an inordinate amount of indigenous women and children go missing and be murdered at much higher rates than both other demographics and other regions across Canada. It should be noted that Tash is located over an hour's drive north of Highway 16. And because of the remote access of the Coos Che Reserve and the surrounding communities, there aren't many out-of-towners or passerbys that make it all the way up to Tash. Most of the forestry and logging work sees a large share of their workers coming in as regulars from the area. So it's simply less likely that an opportunist on Highway 16 would wind all the way up in a secluded area of woodlands instead of just finding someone closer to the highway. 
That's not to say Mackie couldn't have first hitchhiked down to Fort St. James and then been captured by a second hitchhiker in the shadia places of the city. Mackie did have a history of using hitchhiking as her mode of transportation and her own sister, Crystal, was the near victim of a hitchhiking-related crime around the same time. She had been attempting to find a way to get from Fort St. James back to Tash when she decided to hitchhike from two men in a pickup truck, much like Mackie. While the men took various back roads instead of taking the main roads to Tash, Crystal overheard them saying, take her over there. Luckily, she was able to call them out, but imagine if she had never heard them utter that phrase. It should be noted that the men in the story are not considered suspects and have never been identified, but it gives context to what most women face to this day along the Highway of Tears and how many suspicious figures lurk in the surrounding streets. Much like the theories regarding running away and self-harm, there isn't much to use as evidence Mackie wanted to hitchhike that night. It wasn't uncommon for Mackie to spend the night in other places, but if she was going to be out overnight, she would take her travel kit bag with her. The travel kit bag, including all of what little money Mackie had, was found in her room at Peter Basil's house. It wouldn't make any sense to leave those items behind, especially if she was truly planning to be back the next day. It is important to remind ourselves that even if Mackie did run into trouble whilst hitchhiking, and even if she knew that hitchhiking in that area was dangerous, it doesn't make those who hitchhike unintelligent or bad people. For many First Nations men and women, hitchhiking is the only choice they have to get to a grocery store for foods to survive or starve. Indigenous peoples on reserves are not provided the resources to acquire driver's licenses, much less afford a car. Buses are underutilized on reserves and sometimes there aren't even real grocery stores in an entire village, making traveling across highways to neighboring towns a requirement of survival. We must never blame someone's trauma or fate on their decision to hitchhike. Instead, place that energy towards a solution to the transportation problem First Nation peoples experience every single day. It could lead to a lessening of cases along the Highway of Tears. And more people like Mackie could make it home safe and sound without needing to hitch a ride from a total stranger. Writing a conclusion to the case of Immaculate Basil is basically a fool's errand. There is so much information we simply do not have and even an educated guess feels useless. With only a couple of testimonies to scrutinize and a generalized timeline without images or clues left behind, it leaves the pool of persons of interest too vast to navigate. And that's if you agree with the foul play theories in the first place. As we attempt to narrow down the list of potential suspects, we are confident alongside the Basil family that if someone is indeed responsible for Mackie's disappearance, they come from the village of Tash or its surrounding communities. In fact, we go a step further to say the ones at fault most likely attended the same party that Mackie did. Police have said they've interviewed everyone at the party, but what if they missed someone? What if the attendees missed someone as well? Who only showed up for a few minutes before making up their mind they would follow Mackie that night until she was alone? Whoever did it had to know the area well enough to evade capture, but also feel confident they wouldn't leave traces of her behind. They would also have to have the knowledge or resources to take her far enough away from the Tash area that search parties would not recover her body or belongings. While it's not impossible that an opportunist staying in Tash decided to kidnap her and continue along on their way across Highway 16, they would have had to have been incredibly lucky to not leave behind a trail of evidence in a woodland rarely accessed by outsiders. It is our hope that as more people are made aware of Mackie Basil's story, additional eyewitnesses will come forward with information about the party she attended on the evening of June 13, 2013. Someone knows something. And it's never too late to step into the spotlight and bring closure to family and friends who desperately seek it. Mackie Basil did not disappear into thin air on a whim. There is a reason behind it and it's up to us and those still around to find out what it is. It is also our duty to share the story of Immaculate Basil in the proper context of who she was as an individual. She was a spirited and diligent person to those who knew her best, yet quiet and calm. In the face of the public, she found a way to love everyone who crossed her path, introducing optimism to even the darkest of situations. She had the courage to stand up after being knocked down time and time again and did not let the tragedies surrounding her define her individuality. She was a proud artist and a proud mother. The opportunity to search deeper within her culture and heritage was sadly ripped away from her. But the legacy she leaves behind will not be about that. It will be about a young woman who survived, strengthened, and sought to bring peace and joy to those who were around her and those who choose to carry on that positive way of life moving forward.
In late November 2010, the sudden disappearance of a young girl shook the tight-knit community of Brambati di Sopra. It's a small town on the outskirts of the Alps in northern Italy. The investigation that followed is widely considered one of the largest in Italian history. This is the story of Iara Gambarezio and a twisted tale that gripped a nation. Thirteen-year-old Yara Gambarezio came from a large, loving family. She was one of four children to parents, Fulvio and Mora. Her father worked as an architect and her mother as a teacher. Their respective families had lived in the area of Brambate di Sopra for generations. It was a quiet town with 8,000 residents, despite being only an hour from the fashion capital of the world, Milan. Life in Brambati di Sopra could not be more different. Time moved slowly there, and the scenery is quintessential rural Italy with cypress-lined streets and views of distant mountains. It seemed like the ideal place to raise a family. On Friday, November 26, 2010, Yara said goodbye to her family and set off to the local gym where she trained for gymnastics. She left at 5.15 p.m. to walk the short couple 100-meter route like she had done countless times before. Yara needed to drop off a stereo for her instructor and then she would be right back home. When two hours had passed and Yara had still not returned, worry set in for her parents. Yara's mother, Mora, dialed her number, but the call went straight to voicemail. They waited until 7.30 p.m. hoping their daughter would walk through the door with an explanation of something that was keeping her busy until then. Unfortunately, she was still not home and Yara's father, Fulvio, called the police. The call went through to La Tishiro Gary, the magistrate on duty in the nearby city of Bergamo. The experienced magistrate wasted no time in getting authorities out and searching for the missing 13-year-old girl. When retracing her steps, the investigators found out that Yara made it to the gym that day where she saw her instructor. They had done a light training session in preparation for an upcoming competition before Yara left and started the journey back home. The last time anyone had contact with Yara was at 6.44 p.m. when she sent a text message to close friend Martina. She told Martina that they could meet up early the next weekend before the gymnastics meet. There were a few witnesses who claimed to have seen Yara talking to two men near a red car, but this could not be confirmed. They were not completely certain that it was, in fact, Yara. Tracker dogs were brought to the gym to try and trace Yara's route home. Instead, the dogs led their handlers in the opposite direction towards Mapolo, a small commune located less than 10 minutes from Brambati di Sopra. Yara's phone records confirmed that her phone had been in Mapolo at 6.49 that evening. As a standard procedure in missing persons cases, the family is always questioned by authorities. Each member of the Gambarasio family was thoroughly interviewed, which meant the investigators were able to rule them out as potential suspects. Mora and Fulvio were respected members of the community, and Yara was loved dearly by them and her three siblings. The Taziaruguri authorized wiretaps on hundreds of cell phones belonging to possible suspects and had her team try to track down the 15,000-odd devices that had passed through Mapolo on November 26. This led to the identification of their first suspect, a Moroccan man named Mohamed Fikri. A conversation had been overheard where Fikri asked God for forgiveness and mentioned something about not being responsible for taking her life. At the time of Yara's disappearance, Fikri was working in Mapello on a building site. By the time investigators believed he may be linked to the case, he was already gone, heading for Tangiers, a city in northwestern Morocco. The Italian authorities weren't going to give up that easily and set out to intercept the boat. The mission was successful and Fikri was arrested. His van was subsequently searched and lo and behold, a mattress with dried red stains was discovered inside. It seemed like they could be on the right track to finding out what happened to Yara. Until further investigation revealed that the mattress was unrelated to the investigation and that the supposed phrase heard over the wiretap had been mistranslated. Now the investigation began to slow as no obvious fresh suspect stood out to the authorities. The case had garnered national attention with the mystery of Yara's disappearance being filing into Brambati de Sopra. The Gambaracios knew the attention was good for Yara's case, but nonetheless found the intrusion during such a difficult time hard to bear. Over the next three months, the scores of investigators working on Yara's case tracked down every possible lead, checked every possible sighting, and interviewed any possible suspects. That their beautiful young daughter was alive somewhere and would be brought home to them. Tragically, that hope was crushed on February 26, 2011, three months after she was last seen. Larry Oscotti had been flying his model airplane in a town six miles or ten kilometers south of Brambati di Sopra. 
He chose an area away from any public spaces and over an expanse of scrubland to try out his new toy. Hilario was having some issues with the device, which led to him landing it in an overgrown section of shrubbery and weeds. He walked over to the site and waded through before reaching his plane. As Hilario stood back up, something caught his eye. It appeared there was some fabric on the ground. His first thought was that someone dumped some clothing there. But then Hilario saw a pair of shoes. Upon closer inspection, he discovered the remains of a person. While the person had clearly been left in that location for a long time, a few items of clothing stood out. A black jacket and a Hello Kitty sweatshirt. The same clothing items that Yara had last been seen wearing. Further analysis of the scene uncovered Yara's iPod and house keys. Her SIM card and phone battery was also found, but her cell phone was not. The autopsy was performed by Professor Cristina Cartagno, one of Italy's most well-known forensic pathologists. Traces of lime were found in Yara's nose and airway and rope fibers were found on her clothing. This suggested that the person responsible may be a builder or involved in the building trade. Yara's body had multiple marks sustained from a sharp object. The saddest finding of all was that she had lost her life due to exposure, not a direct result of her injuries. Two DNA samples were recovered at the scene, one on Yara's gloves and the other on her phone battery. The samples were run against the national system, but neither person had been recorded before. All of the items were shipped off for further investigation, including Yara's clothing items. This is how a third DNA profile was discovered two months later on Yara's underwear. Authorities believe there had been a struggle and the perpetrator had injured himself, hence the DNA being left behind. The suspect was named Ignoto 1, meaning unknown one. Now they just needed to find who this DNA belonged to. The investigators ordered DNA samples to be collected from everyone close to Yara. That included family members, friends, and locals who frequented areas that Yara had. Other officers were in charge of cross-referencing phone records of devices that had moved through when a number was found, the owner was tracked down and asked to provide their DNA. This was not glamorous police work. It took hundreds upon hundreds of hours looking through data and trying to put faces to these numbers. Each new sample took a few hours to analyze and get a profile from, with multiple geneticists from across Italy working overtime to get them logged. The search for Yara and the subsequent search to track down the perpetrator has gone down as one of the largest and most expensive manhunts in Italy's history. Yara was finally laid to rest at the end of May 2011. In the months following the discovery of her body, thousands of DNA samples had been analyzed, but still, there had not been a hit against unknown one. Letizia Ruggieri decided to look at another angle. She knew that many perpetrators tend to dispose of their victims in areas that they are comfortable in or familiar with. Where Yara's body was found, there was a nightclub not far away. She knew it was a long shot, but Letizia ordered officers to take DNA samples from club patrons outside on busy Friday and Saturday nights. This is how Damiano Garanone entered the picture. Damiano frequently attended the nightclub and his DNA sample bared a striking resemblance to unknown one. But he had a rock-solid alibi since he was in South America during the time that Yara was last seen. Still, the authorities weren't giving up on this lead and geneticists were convinced that unknown one was a relative of Damiano Garanoni. Every member of the Garanoni family was looked into and a shocking link to the Gambriagios was discovered. Damiano's mother, Aurora, had worked for the family as a domestic helper for ten whole years. Yara and Aurora were close. Aurora always made sure to keep an eye out for Yara, seeing that she did not get up to nonsense and Yara loved to show off her new gymnastics moves to Aurora. Even though she stopped working for Fulvio and Mora, Aurora maintained a good relationship with the family. So imagine her shock when she found herself at the center of the investigation. It was the worst thing that could happen to me. Aurora later confessed. Both Aurora and her son, Damiano, were extensively questioned. The pair's phone calls were monitored and they were followed. After months of trying to find any connection between either of them, what happened to Yara, Letizia admitted resigning herself to the fact that, in the end, this was nothing more than a sick coincidence. At the one-year anniversary of Yara losing her life, the pressure on authorities to bring the person responsible to justice was reaching a breaking point. Various politicians were making digs at Letizia, questioning her competence as magistrate, despite her running a textbook investigation from the get-go. But she could not let this background noise distract her from solving Yara's case, so she doubled down on the only viable lead so far, Damiano's DNA profile. They focused on building an extensive family tree of those around Damiano, which resulted in hundreds of names being catalogued. 
Relatives as far back as 1815 were recorded until an immense family tree lay before them. This led investigators to the sleepy village of Gorno where the same families have lived for generations, including the Gernonis. Damiano's uncle Giuseppe passed away in 1999. Investigators hoped they could somehow obtain a DNA sample from him. So they visited his widow, Laura, in September 2011. As luck would have it, she was able to provide two stamps that her late husband had licked. The results showed that unknown one was likely Giuseppe's son, making him Damiano's first cousin. Giuseppe worked as a bus driver and was a talented accordion player, putting his talent to use at Gorno festivals. He had three children with Laura, two sons, and a daughter. When their DNA was compared to unknown one, neither came back as a perfect match. Since neither of them had children, the next logical explanation was that Giuseppe had another son out there that they did not know about, one that he did not have with Laura. Letitia described this as an investigation within an investigation, so how on earth would they track down Giuseppe's illegitimate son? Through their deep dive into Giuseppe's personal life, investigators found out that he visited a resort called Solistum every May from the early 1960s. It was an annual tradition for him. These trips were made without his wife, Laura. The spring months of 2012 were spent looking through Salas Tum's records, tracking down women whose time at the resort overlapped Giuseppe's. The effort proved fruitless, as did searching through orphanage records and women's shelters. They came to the conclusion that the possible woman they were searching for was most likely married. Divorce in Italy had been illegal until 1970, so even if the mystery woman had an affair with Giuseppe, she likely stayed married. During this time, Yara's parents had hired a freelance geneticist, Giorgio Porera, to look over the investigation and explain to them, in layman's terms, what everything meant. After reviewing the information, Giorgio campaigned for Giuseppe's body to be exhumed so a proper DNA analysis could be performed. The DNA taken from the stamp could only compare part of unknown one's DNA sequence. His wish was granted on March 7, 2013, when Giuseppe's body was exhumed. This effort confirmed that, without a shadow of a doubt, Giuseppe was unknown one's father. He did have a son out there who was responsible for Yara's passing. The authorities kept details of the information private for the most part, much to the frustration of the media desperate for a story. Slowly, rumors started to spread about Giuseppe's illegitimate son, who was believed to have taken Yara's life. As an array of journalists started their own investigation, many affairs and family secrets were uncovered. Things began playing out like a soap opera in the small towns, but a breakthrough was on the horizon. Marshal Giovanni Macherino worked closely with Letizia. He worked in an office alongside her own. Marshall was a well-liked man with a stubborn streak by his own admittance. Yara's case had caused him many sleepless nights and four years with no breaks, working towards bringing the man responsible to justice. In stark contrast to the high-tech work that went into analyzing the DNA samples and tracking phone records, Marshall was more old school. He liked getting out into the community and talking to people, making them feel comfortable by talking face to face. Through this, Marshall found out many details of Giuseppe's life. As previously mentioned, Giuseppe worked as a bus driver and Marshall managed to track down his old colleagues. The main bus route for the drivers was taking factory workers to the abundant textile factories in the area. Many of these passengers were women. The drivers often described Giuseppe as somewhat of a ladies' man. While Marshall became acquainted with every aspect of Giuseppe's life, a name came up, Esterus Ruffi. Esther was born and raised in Pont de Selva, where Giuseppe lived since the early 1960s. Giuseppe actually lived not far from Esther at the time. When she was 19 years old, Esther got married and moved to a nearby village. She worked at a textile mill and would take the bus daily to her job. This is how Esther met Giuseppe. Her husband was a sickly man who used a cane. And during her frequent trips in Giuseppe's bus, Esther fell in love. Did investigators finally have their missing link? Letitia and her team checked their database to see if Esther happened to be on file. They found that a sample had been taken from Esther back in 2012, but a lab error meant it was not showing on the system. The result was conclusive when the moment came to run Esther's DNA against unknown one. Had her sample been correctly logged in the first place, this very well may have come to light two years earlier. Esther left the home with her husband and they moved back to Ponte Selva in 1970. The couple welcomed twins that same year, a boy and a girl. The little boy was named Massimo. In 2014, Massimo Bassetti was 44 years old and married with children. The family lived together in Mapello, the same town where Yara's cell phone had last pinged. 
Now that Letizia had a name, she wasted no time in tracking down Bosetti and collecting a DNA sample from him to compare it against Unknown One. This would be the final puzzle piece if it confirmed that his DNA was found on Yara's body. They knew asking Bosetti directly for a sample would raise suspicion. So they came up with a clever plan, but first they needed to find him. Bosetti was observed for a few days where the team learned he had a fairly set routine. He worked in construction and returned home each evening at the same time in his small truck. Bosetti seemed like any other family man. After establishing his routine and confirming what car he drove, the plan was set into action. While Bosetti was out driving, an officer pulled him over and explained they were breathalyzing drivers to catch people driving over the legal limit. Bosetti was asked to blow into the device. His initial response was a chuckle followed by, I do not drink. The officer persisted and got Bosetti to complete the test. The officer then looked down at his breathalyzer and explained to Bosetti that it seemed to be faulty before asking him to blow into a second device. It showed that Bosetti had not been drinking that day, so he was free to go. As he drove off, the officer jogged back to his car armed with two quality DNA samples from their prime suspect. They were sent off to the lab immediately and ran as they arrived. By early afternoon, authorities had their answer. Massimo Bosetti was unknown one. On June 16, 2014, Bassetti was pounced on by police and taken into custody, where he was charged with taking the life of Yara Gambarasio. During their investigation into Bassetti, investigators found that he frequented areas near where Yara lived. He often ate at a pizzeria down the road and would park his car behind the gym where Yara practiced her gymnastics. He also got regular suntans from a local shop. His internet search history showed a twisted desire for teenage girls and his phone records showed he was in Brembati di Sopra when Yara disappeared. Bosetti intentionally turned his phone off at 5.45 p.m., only turning it back on the following morning. When he was questioned, Bosetti remained silent and claimed he was not guilty. His legal team decided to call the DNA evidence into question, saying that while it may prove he had contact with Yara, it did not prove he was responsible for her slaying. The trial began in mid-2015 and lasted an entire year. It revealed the sheer extent of the investigation where over 18,000 DNA samples had been analyzed. After multiple witnesses took the stand and dozens of pieces of evidence presented, it was time for a ruling. The Court of Bergamo, overseen by Judge Antonella Pertogia, found him guilty on July 1, 2016. Bosetti was given a life sentence. Yara's case is unique for many reasons. Not only was her loss felt by her family, but the investigation into finding the monster who took her away from them upended multiple other families. Giuseppe's widow now had to come to terms with the fact that her husband had been unfaithful and that his son was the man responsible for this deplorable crime. Bassetti's mother and sister also have to live with what he had done, along with many other scandals that were uncovered along the way. It of course goes without saying that the loss of the bright young girl that was Yara Gambaracio is by far the hardest to swallow. We still do not know exactly what happened that night as Bosetti still maintains his maybe one day the truth will come to light. In an 18-month stretch from February 2003 to August 2004, three young women were preyed upon by a malicious monster out to inflict as much harm as possible. Each of these women had been out in public minding their own business when a man decided he would try to take their lives in a horrific manner, from trauma to the head to using his vehicle as his weapon of choice. Towards the end of 2004, the man was captured and taken into custody. He was found guilty of the charges a few years later, but in a shocking twist, he was linked to another unsolved slaying that had happened eight years earlier. Amanda Jane Dowler, or Millie as she was known, was born on June 25, 1988, to parents Bob and Sally Dowler. Millie had an older sister, Gemma, who she adored. The girls got on extremely well and were practically best friends. Gemma described her sister as friendly and vivacious with a sparkle in her eye. She had many close friends and was a kind, generous young girl who loved to cheer others up when they were having a bad day. Millie was a bright light in the lives of those around her, making her sudden disappearance all the hotter to bear. It was March 21, 2002. Thirteen-year-old Millie left Heathside School at 3.07 p.m. and walked to the Weybridge Railway Station with a friend. Both girls got on a train and rode to the walton on Thames Station. This was one stop before where Millie usually got off at Hersham. The girls had decided to grab a bite to eat at the station cafe. Millie made a call to her father at 3.47 p.m., telling him she would be home in the next 30 minutes. 
The girls parted ways at 4.05 p.m. and Millie set off home. The last time she was seen was waiting at a bus stop on Station Avenue where a friend of Gemma recognized her. CCTV cameras further along the route showed no sign of Millie. Millie didn't arrive home as planned, and worry started to set in. By 7 p.m., her parents called the police and reported her as missing. A large-scale search operation followed by numerous different officers on foot looking for Millie. Police helicopters were also deployed, hoping to catch a glimpse of the young girl or find something that showed signs of her being in a particular area. Local rivers were searched, and the route Millie should have taken was gone over with a fine-tooth comb. When the CCTV cameras along Station Avenue were accessed, a red Daiwa Nexia was pictured at 4.32 p.m. Seven years later, we would find out who was behind the wheel. Detectives working on the case made multiple public appeals for any witnesses who may have seen anything suspicious or seen Millie herself that day. Her disappearance was so sudden that initial theories revolved around Millie either purposely running away or knowing the person who took her. How could a complete stranger have grabbed her at this time of day in a fairly public setting? It didn't make any sense. Millie's family was adamant that she wouldn't have run away. Crime Watch UK aired a reconstruction of Millie's last known movements and featured a direct appeal to the young girl, as Millie having run away was the definite best-case scenario. But her mother couldn't fathom why her youngest daughter would do such a thing. Years later, it was publicly revealed that Millie had written layers saying she was going to leave home and expressing some unhappiness. In reality, these letters were nothing more than a teenage girl writing her completely normal frustrations out on paper. After what was likely a typical argument with her parents or sister, nothing more. On March 28th, the police still didn't believe they were dealing with a stranger taking Millie by force. No witnesses had come forward having witnessed any sort of struggle, despite Millie having been seen on multiple occasions throughout the afternoon. They felt it was unlikely she had gone anywhere with a stranger, hence believing she was familiar with the person she left with. For weeks went by with few leads and still no sign of Millie. On April 23, 2002, a body was found in the River Thames and immediately speculation ran wild that this could be Millie Deller. It was later confirmed that the remains were that of 73-year-old Macy Thomas. She had disappeared the year prior and her passing was ruled as non-suspicious. Macy likely drowned. Weeks turned into months with still no new information about what had happened to Millie. Frustrations continued to grow for the dollars, not understanding how their daughter could just disappear into thin air. As if things couldn't get any worse, the family themselves started facing scrutiny, with Bob Dowler being the main target. Since the police had stated on many occasions that Millie likely knew whoever she had left with, naturally the media latched on to that person being a family member. While trying to come to terms with their loss, they also had to contend with stories being published and unfounded rumors spreading. Bob Dowler had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance, which made the focus on him hard to bear. Not only was it a horrific thing to be accused of, but Bob knew that all the time spent looking at him was time wasted on finding the person who was really responsible. Authorities later apologized for the possibility of missing crucial leads while looking at Bob for Millie's disappearance. By June, the authorities spoke to the dollars and told them they needed to brace themselves for the worst-case scenario. Bob and Sally continued to send their daughter text messages, hoping she was still out there somewhere. That month, a £100,000 reward was offered by The Sun. But still, no one came forward with any useful information. In September 2002, everyone's worst fears were realized. It was September 18th and a small group of mushroom pickers were out in Yately Heathwoods in Yately, Hampshire when one of them spotted something in the undergrowth. It was a body. The authorities were immediately identified and dental records confirmed that they had found Millie Deller. She was found unclothed with none of the items she had in her possession when she disappeared. That included her backpack, purse, and cell phone. To this day, none of the items have ever been recovered. The case was no longer a missing person investigation. Authorities were now looking for the person responsible for taking Millie's life. The Surrey police launched the investigation titled Operation Ruby to bring this monster to justice. A month after Millie was found, the Surrey police set up a large-scale roadblock near Yately Heathwoods. Roughly 6,000 motorists were stopped and questioned, but this produced no new leads. Items from Millie's bedroom were taken in for forensic testing, and on March 23, 2003, a year after she was last seen alive, unknown male DNA was found on one of her items of clothing. This led authorities to theorize that Millie had potentially met with the man who took her life before she vanished. This lead was shortly ruled out. 
despite hundreds of people being interviewed, extensive house-to-house -house inquiries, and a thorough look into some unsavory characters that lived near where Millie was last seen and near where her body had been found, the Surrey police still had nothing. The next possible lead came when the Dowlers received a chilling letter from someone claiming to be responsible for what happened to Millie. It didn't take long to work out the letter was written by Paul Hughes, who was in jail at the time for indecent acts to a young girl. He was given an additional five years behind bars for the letter and the threats he made to Millie's sister, Gemma. The prison service made an apology to the Dowlers for not having intercepted the letter before it was sent to them. Other sick individuals also viewed Millie's disappearance and passing as some sort of Leah Newman made multiple phone calls claiming to be Millie before her blog was found. She called Bob and Sally, the police, and even Millie's school. Newman was given a five-month prison sentence after pleading guilty to making these phone calls. Gary Farr, a mentally ill man, repeatedly emailed those close to Millie and the investigators claiming she had been smuggled into Poland. Farah claimed her body was nothing more than a cover-up. He was eventually sanctioned under the Mental Health Act for indefinite holding due to being a danger to the public. Behind all of this nonsense, there was still a family desperate to know what happened to their Millie, but the truth was years away. On February 4, 2003, 19-year-old Marsha McDonald was hit over the head with a blunt object not far from her Hampton home. The incident happened not long after Marsha had gotten off the 111 bus at the Percy Road bus stop. Tragically, Marsha lost her life two days later in hospital. On May 28th of the following year, 18-year-old Kate Sheedy was walking home when she noticed a suspicious car parked on the roadside. A man was inside and the engine was running but the lights were deliberately turned off. Kate decided to move away from the vehicle and cross the road. Before she even knew what happened, Kate was run over by the car. Proving this wasn't an accident, the man then reversed over Kate's body before racing off. Miraculously, Kate was able to drag herself off the road and find help. Despite the severity of her condition, Kate survived after a lengthy hospital stay. Three months later, another young woman was preyed upon. Amélie Delagange was a 20-year-old French student visiting England. Shockingly, Amélie's life was taken in a brutal manner similar to that of Marcia McDonald. It took authorities less than 24 hours to link the cases. On November 22, 2000, in 2004, a man was arrested for what had happened to Amélie de la Grange. His name was Levi Belfield. Levi Rabbits was born on May 17, 1968, in Islesworth, London, to parents Jean and Joseph Rabbits. It is unclear exactly when he changed his surname to Belfield from Rabbits, but we do know that was his mother's maiden name. When he was still a child, Belfield's father passed away after battling with leukemia. He grew up with his four siblings on a council estate in southwest London and attended Crane Junior High School. When Belfield was in his early teens, he was convicted of breaking into a house and stealing various items. That was in 1981. In 1990, Belfield got into a physical altercation which resulted in a second charge. His criminal history is littered with multiple offenses and convictions, but none of them were as serious as what he would later be accused of. Belfield has 11 children with five women. His ex-girlfriends later described Belfield's behavior as charming initially before his true colors started to show. All of the women shared the same stories of what Belfield was like as a partner. This is what Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton, who worked on the later cases involving Belfield, had to say of the man. When we started dealing with him, he came across as very jokey, like he's your best mate. But he's a cunning individual, violent. He can switch from being nice to being nasty instantly. In 2003 and 2004, Levi Belfield operated a wheel clamping business. This gave him an intimate knowledge of the streets he stalked. Like a wild animal looking for its next meal, Levi would prowl the streets looking for a suitable victim. Detective Sutton commented on this mentality of Belfield, saying, Belfield has a massive ego to feed. He thinks he's God's gift to everyone. He drives around in his car, feels a bit whatever, and sees some young blonde girl. The young blonde girl says, go away. And he thinks, you dare to turn down Levi Belfield. You're worth nothing. And then she gets a whack over the head. It is shown in the case of Kate Sheedy. She was smart enough to think she didn't like the look of his car and cross the road. He thinks, you think you're so clever and whoosh, he runs her over. After CCTV linked him to Amelie's case, Belfield was surveilled by undercover officers who witnessed him talking to young girls at bus stops. It was quite clear that had he not been taken into custody, more women would have lost their lives. On February 25, 2008, 
Levi Belfield was found guilty of taking Marsha McDonald's and Amelie Delagrange's lives. He was also convicted of his actions towards Kate Sheedy. On February 26, Belfield found he would be spending the rest of his life behind bars. His defense passed the news on to Belfield as he refused to be in court that day. Levi Belfield was also considered in two other cases, falsely imprisoning 17-year-old Anna Maria Renback in October 2001 and attempting to take the life of Irma Dragosi in December 2003. Both women identified Belfield as the person responsible, but juries failed to reach a unanimous verdict in both cases. Following his convictions, 39-year-old Belfield was publicly named as a chief suspect in Millie's case. This was mainly due to CCTV footage that tied him to the Red Day Wunexia scene around the time Millie was last seen on the same road that she had been on. Further investigation showed that Belfield's then-girlfriend owned the car and she lived in the same area as the Dowlers. In an interview Belfield did with the Daily Mirror in 2009, he said, So we've got to be realistic about it. But then I've got to be careful about how I answer these questions. I did use the Dewu once and I was stopped by the police once in it for speeding. It is unclear why Belfield thought this was the right thing to say when being considered for something so heinous. Like Millie's items, the car was never found. In March 2010, investigators felt certain they had their man. And Levi Belfield was charged with snatching Millie from the road and taking her life. Belfield's trial began on May 10, 2011 in the Central Criminal Court presided over by Mr. Justice Wilkie. It took place over six weeks before a verdict was reached. In his opening statement, the prosecuting barrister recounted what happened to Millie on her final day. On this day, an entirely innocent and quite ordinary diversion to a station cafe to buy some chips with some school friends was a decision that was to cost Millie her life because it meant her taking a fateful journey along Station Avenue. Belfield was found guilty on June 23, 2011 and given a second life sentence. Years later, Belfield admitted to what he had done to Millie. The Dowlers finally had some sort of closure, but still a sour taste was left in the mouths by many aspects of the investigation. Sally spoke to journalists and explained, Our family life has been scrutinized and laid open for everyone to inspect. Bob said that the price for this conviction had been far too costly for the family. She later described what she witnessed as one of the worst days in her life. The defense attempted to paint Millie as a depressed teen, not the vivacious girl those around her knew. Millie's story was subsequently brought back into the spotlight on June 30, 2011, when Crime Watch aired a special titled, Taken, The Millie Dollar Story. The program detailed the investigation, had witness interviews, and had Millie's family involved. Reconstruction was also featured, where they reenacted how that day unfolded. Millie's family was finally able to show the nation who Millie was as a person beyond the sensationalized headlines. After everything, one question still remained. Was Belfield responsible for more slayings? Patricia Joyce Morris was born on January 10, 1966 to parents George, a retired army chief, and Marjorie Morris. She was one of three siblings with a sister and two brothers. Patsy, as she was fondly known, was born in Birmingham but moved to Islesworth, southwest London when she was 13 years old. On June 16, 1980, Patsy disappeared during a lunch break at school. It has been theorized that the 14-year-old decided to walk home that day as she needed to change into dry clothes after she had been without a raincoat that morning. On her way there, Patsy vanished. Two days later, a police dog found her body on Hounslow Heath. She had been left face down in a thicket just a quarter mile from her home, had been used to take her life. Levi Belfield was 12 years old at the time. After leaving Crane Junior School, he moved to Feltham Comprehensive, the same school that Patsy attended. In fact, Belfield had been her childhood boyfriend. A year after what happened to Patsy, Belfield was convicted of the first official crime of burglary. He wasn't at school on the day Patsy was last seen. And he knew the area where she was found very well. When Patsy's mother learned of where her daughter was discovered, it caused great confusion. She didn't understand why Patsy would have walked through there. We can't understand what she was doing on the heath. She was always told not to go there and never disobeyed our orders, she told the press. Knowing now that Belfield used to hang out there, often skipping school to do so, it does make you wonder. But was Belfield born evil? Could a boy that age really be capable of committing something like that? Following the conclusion of Millie's case, the possibility was explored. 
When Patsy's father, George Morris, heard about Belfield's connection to his daughter, he recalled a time all those years ago when a teenage boy had called his house and given him a death threat. He believes that was Belfield. He's a local man, which is why it could be him. And it's terrifying to think that someone of 12 or 13 could have done it, George said. Patsy Morris wasn't the only unsolved slaying that Belfield was considered for. In 1990, 51-year-old housewife Judith Gold was found a stone's throw from her Hampstead home having been viciously struck in the head with an unknown item. Similar incidents took place across London from 1990 to 2004. All of these cases could be linked to Belfield due to the nature of them. The weapons of choice were distinct, the same type of weapons he used on Marcia and Amelie. While they couldn't confirm without a shadow of a doubt that he was the person responsible, he could also not be ruled out in any of the many incidents except for one. On July 6, 1996, 45-year-old Lynn Russell and her young daughter Megan, the pair and Lynn's other daughter, 9-year-old Josie, were ambushed while walking home from a swimming gala. They were then tied up and struck repeatedly with a hammer. Lynn, Megan, and the family dog lost their lives that day. Miraculously, Josie survived. While she was able to make a full recovery, it is highly likely that she still lives with the mental scars of what happened that tragic day. Belfield allegedly confessed to the crime to his cellmate. Belfield denies ever making this confession. His ex-girlfriend, who helped get a conviction in Millie's trial, has always maintained that Belfield was with her that day. My daughter was born in 96 and that was the day of my birthday. He, Belfield, never left my side all day and all night. So there's absolutely no way he could have gone from Twickenham, where I lived, or Windsor, where I kept my horses, to Kent. Do what they say he did and get back without me knowing he was there. I can hand to my heart, I hate to say it, but I can say hand to my heart. He didn't do it, she said. Michael Stone was convicted of the charges after a second trial following a successful appeal from his first conviction. Michael Stone had been behind bars since 2001. He still maintains his innocence. There have been many other cases that Belfield was considered for and some that he allegedly confessed to. But as of today, police have not been able to find any substantial evidence that ties Belfield to any of these cases. Maybe one day the police will track down who was responsible for taking these lives. And maybe that man may just be Levi Belfield. Levi Belfield remains behind bars at HMP Franklin in County Durham. He will never set foot in the outside world again. On June 29, 2017, Gemma released a book titled My Sister Millie. In the heartfelt piece, Gemma describes what it was like living through that wild time, dealing with the loss of her sister, the media circus, and the suspicions of her parents. Gemma explains how she found healing. As an excerpt from the blub reads and Gemma's and about the love that kept the family together as they struggled with terrible darkness and injustice. 